Section 33 of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 5, Chapter 7. Not a Revolt. Why dwell on what follows? Hulin's foie d'officer should have been kept, but could not. The Swiss stand drawn up, disguised in white canvas smocks, the invalide without disguise, their arms all piled against the wall. The first rush of victors, in ecstasy that the death peril is past, leaps joyfully on their necks. But new victors rush, and ever new, also in ecstasy not wholly of joy. As we said, it was a living deluge plunging headlong, had not the Garde Francaise, in their cool military way, wheeled round with arms levelled, it would have plunged suicidally, by the hundred or the thousand, into the Bastille ditch. And so it goes plunging through court and corridor, billowing uncontrollable firing from windows on itself, in hot frenzy of triumph, of grief and vengeance for its slain. The poor invalid will fare ill. One Swiss, running off in his white smock, is driven back with a deaf thrust. Let all prisoners be marched to the town hall to be judged. Alas, already one poor invalid has his right hand slashed of him, his maimed body dragged to the place de Grève and hanged there. This same right hand, it is said, turned back Delaunay from the powder magazine and saved Paris. Delaunay, discovered in grey frock with puppy-coloured riband, is for killing himself with the sword of his cane. He shall to the Hotel de Ville, Hulin, Maillard, and others escorting him, Eli marching foremost with the capitulation paper on his sword's point. Through roarings and cursings, through hustlings, clutchings, and at last, through strokes, your escort is hustled aside, fell down. Hulin sinks exhausted on a heap of stones. Miserable Delaunay, he shall never enter the Hotel de Ville. Only his bloody hair cue held up in a bloody hand that shall enter for a sign. The bleeding trunk lies on the steps there. The head is off through the streets, ghastly aloft on a pike. Rigorous Delaunay has died, crying out, O oh, friends, kill me fast. Merciful Delors must die. Through gratitude embraces him in this fearful hour and will die for him. It avails not. Brothers, your wrath is cruel. Your place de grève is become a throat of the tiger, full of mere fierce billowings and thirst of blood. One other officer is massacred, one other invalide is hanged on the lamp iron, with difficulty, with generous perseverance. The garde française will save the rest. Provost Flessel, stricken long since with the paleness of death, must descend from his seat to be judged at the Palais Royal, alas, to be shot dead by an unknown hand at the turning of the first street. O oh, evening sun of July, how at this hour thy beams fall slant on reapers amid peaceful woody fields, on old women spinning in cottages, on ships far out in the silent main, on balls at the orangery of Versailles, where high rouged dames of the palace are even now dancing with double jacketed USA officers, and also on this warring hell porch of a hotel de ville, Babel Tower with the confusion of tongues, where not Bedlam added with the conflagration of thoughts, was no type of it. One forest of distracted steel bristles, endless, in front of an electoral committee, points itself, in horrid ready eye, against this and the other accused breast. It was the titans warring with Olympus, and their scarcely crediting it, have conquered, prodigy of prodigies, delirious, as it could not but be. Denunciation, vengeance, blaze of triumph on the dark ground of terror, all outward, all inward things fallen into one general wreck of madness. Electoral committee? Had it a thousand throats of brass, it would not suffice. Abbe Lefebvre in the vault stand below is black as Vulcan, distributing that five thousand weight of powder with what perils these forty-eight hours. Last night, a patriot, in liquor, insisted on sitting to smoke on the edge of one of the powder barrels. There smoked he, independent of the world, till the abbe purchased his pipe for three francs and pitched it far. 
Ellie in the Grand Hall, Electoral Committee looking on, sits with drawn sword bent in three places, with battered helm, for he was of the Queen's Regiment, Calvary, with torn regimentals, face singed and soiled, comparable something to an antique warrior judging the people, forming a list of pasty heroes. O oh, friends, stain not with blood the greenest laurels ever gained in this world. Such is the burden of Ellie's song. Could it but be listened to? Courage, Ellie, courage, ye municipal electors. A declining sun, the need of victuals and of telling news, will bring assuagement, dispersion, all earthly things must end. Along the streets of Paris circulate seven Bastille prisoners, borne shoulder high, seven heads on pikes, the keys of the Bastille, and much else. See also the Garde Française in their steadfast military way, marching home to their barracks, with the Invalide and Swiss kindly enclosed in Hollow Square. It is one year and two months since these same men stood unparticipating, with Brennus d'August at the Palais de Justice when fate overtook Despréminil. And now they have participated and will participate, not Garde Française henceforth, but centre grenadier of the National Guard, men of iron discipline and humour, not without a kind of thought in them. Likewise, Ashlar stones of the Bastille continue thundering through the dusk. Its paper archives shall fly white. Old secrets come to view, and long-buried despair finds voice. Read this portion of an old letter, dated à la Bastille, 7th of October, 1752. If for my consolation Monseigneur would grant me for the sake of God and the most blessed Trinity that I could have news of my dear wife, were it only her name on card to show that she is alive, it were the greatest consolation I could receive, and I should for ever bless the greatness of Monseigneur. Poor prisoner, who namest thyself, Quere Demery, and hast no other history. She is dead, that dear wife of thine, and thou art dead. Tis fifty years since thy breaking heart put this question, to be heard now first, and long heard, in the hearts of men. But so does the July twilight thicken, so must Paris, as sick children and all distracted creatures do, roll itself finally into a kind of sleep. Municipal electors, astonished to find their heads still uppermost, are home. Only Moreau de Saint-Méry of tropical birth and heart, of coolest judgment, he with two others shall sit permanent at the town hall. Paris sleeps, gleams upward the illuminated city, patrols go clashing without common watchword. There go rumours, alarms of war, to the extent of fifteen thousand men marching through the suburb Saint-Antoine, who never got it marched through. Of the day's distraction, judged by this of the night, Moreau de Saint-Méry, before rising from his seat, gave upwards of three thousand orders. What a head, comparable to Friar Bacon's brass head. Within it lies old Paris. Prompt must the answer be, right or wrong, in Paris is no other authority extent. Seriously, a most cool, clear head, for which also, though all brave Saint-Méry, in many capacities, from August senator to merchant's clerk, book dealer, vice-king, in many places, from Virginia to Sardinia, shalt, ever as a brave man, find employment. Bézinval has decamped, under cloud of dusk, amid a great affluence of people, who did not harm him. He marches, with faint growing tread, down the left bank of the Seine, all night, towards infinite space. Resummoned shall Bézinval himself be, for trial, for difficult acquittal, his kin's troops, his royal allemand, are gone hence for ever. The Versailles bowl and lemonade is done. The orangerie is silent except for night birds. Over in the Salle des Menus, Vice President Lafayette, with unsnuffed lights, with some hundred of members stretched on tables round him, sits erect, out watching the bear. This day, a second solemn deputation went to His Majesty, a second and then a third, with no effect. What will the end of these things be? In the court, all is mystery, not without whisperings of terror. Though ye dream of lemonade and epaulette, ye foolish woman, his majesty, kept in happy ignorance, perhaps dreams of double barrels in the woods of Meudon. Late at night, the Duc de Lyoncourt, having official right of entrance, gains access to the royal apartments, unfolds with earnest clearness, 
in his constitutional way, the job news. Mais, said Paul Louis, c'est une révolte. Why, that is a revolt. Sire, answered Liancourt, it is not a revolt, it is a revolution. End of section 33「Section 34 of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Allen. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 5, Chapter 8. Conquering Your King. On the morrow, a fourth deputation to the chateau is on foot, of a more solemn not to say awful character, for besides orgies in the orangery, it seems, the grain convoys are all stopped, nor has Mirabeau's thunder been silent. Such deputations is on the point of setting out, when, lo, his majesty himself, attended only by his two brothers, step in, quite in the paternal manner, announces that the troops and all causes of offense are gone, and henceforth there shall be nothing but trust, reconcilement, goodwill, whereof he permits and even requests a national assembly to assure Paris in his name. Acclamation, as of men suddenly delivered from death, gives answer. The whole assembly spontaneously rises to escort his majesty back, interlacing their arms to keep off the excessive pressure from him, for all Versailles is crowding and shouting. The chateau musicians, with a felicitous promptitude, Strike up the sen de sa famille, bosom of one's family. The queen appears at the balcony with her little boy and girl, kissing them several times, infinite vivats, spread far and wide, and suddenly there has come, as it were, a new heaven on earth. Eighty-eight august senators, Bailey, Lafayette, and our repentant archbishop among them, take coach for Paris, with the great intelligence, benedictions without end on their heads, from the Bloc Louis Quans, where they alight, all the way to the Hôtel de Ville. It is one sea of tricolor cockades, of clear national muskets, one tempest of hazangs, hand flapping, aided by occasional rollings of drum music. Harangues of due fervor are delivered, especially by Lali Talendal, highest son of the ill-fated murdered Lali on whose head, in consequence, a civic crown of oak or parsley is forced, which he forcibly transfers to Bailey's. But surely, for one thing, the National Guard must have a general, Maru de Saint-Marie. He is of the three thousand orders, casts one of his significant glances on the bust of Lafayette, which has stood there ever since the American War of Liberty, whereupon, by acclamation, Lafayette is nominated, again, in room of the slain traitor or quasi-traitor Flacelle. President Bailey shall be provost of the merchants? No, mayor of Paris. So be it. Mayor de Paris. Mayor Bailey. General Lafayette. Vive Bailey. Vive Lafayette. The universal out-of-doors multitude rends the welkin in confirmation. And now, finally. Let us to Notre Dame for a Te Deum. Towards Notre Dame Cathedral, in glad procession, these regenerators of the country walk through a jubilant people in fraternal manner. Abe Lefebvre, still black with his gunpowder services, walking arm in arm with the white stoled archbishop. Poor Bailey comes upon the foundling children, sets to kneel to him, and weeps. Te Deum our archbishop officiating, is not only sung, but shot with blank cartridges. Our joy is boundless, as our woe threatened to be. Paris, by her own pike and musket, and the valor of her own heart, has conquered the very war gods, to the satisfaction now of majesty itself. A courier is, this night, getting under way for Necker, the people's minister, invited back by king by National Assembly, and nation, shall traverse France amid shoutings, and the sound of trumpet and timbrel. Seeing which course of things, measures of the court triumvirate, 
Majors of the dead born Broglie ministry, and other such, consider that their part also is clear to mount and ride. Off, ye two loyal Broglies, Blingettes, and princes of the blood! Off while it is yet time! Did not the Palais Royal, in its late nocturnal violent motions, set a specific price, place of payment not mentioned, on each of your heads? With precautions, with the aid of pieces of cannon and regiments that can be depended on, Majors, between the sixteenth night and the seventeenth morning, get to their several roads, men galloping at full speed, with a view, it is thought, to fling him into the river Oise, at Pont Saint Mayence. The Polignacs travel disguised, friends, not servants, on their coach box. Broglie has his own difficulties at Versailles runs his own risks at Mentz and Verdun, does nevertheless get safe to Luxembourg, and there rests. This is what they call the first emigration, determined on, as appears, in full court conclave, his majesty assisting, prompt he, for his share of it, to follow any counsel whatsoever. Three sons of France, and four princes of the blood of Saint-Louis, says Weber, could not more effectually humble the burghers of Paris than by appearing to withdraw in fear of their life. Alas, the burghers of Paris bear it with unexpected stoicism. The man d'Artois indeed is gone, but has he carried, for example, the land d'Artois with him? Not even Bagatelle, the country house, which shall be useful as a tavern. Hardly the four valet breeches, leaving the breeches maker. As for old Falloon, one learns that he is dead. At least a sumptuous funeral is going on, the undertakers honoring him, if no other will. Intendant Berthier, his son-in-law, is still living, lurking. He joined Bensonville on that Eumenides Sunday, appearing to treat it with levity, and is now fled no man knows whither. The emigration has not gone many miles. Prince Condé hardly across the Ouise, when His Majesty, according to arrangement, for the immigration also thought it might do good, undertakes a rather daring enterprise, that of visiting Paris in person, with a hundred members of assembly, with small or no military escort, which indeed he dismissed at the bridge of Sevres. Poor Louis sets out, leaving a desolate palace, a queen weeping, the present, the past and the future, all so unfriendly for her. At the barrier of Passy, Mayor Bailey, in grand gala, presents him with the keys, harangues him in academic style, mentions that it is a great day, that in Henri Quatre's case, the king had to make conquest of his people, but in this happier case, the people makes conquest of its king, a conquis son roi, the king, so happily conquered, drives forward slowly through a steel people, all silent, or shouting only, Vive la nation, is harangued at the town hall by Moreau of the three thousand orders, by King's procurer, Major Ethys de Corny, by Lali Tolindal, and others. Knows not what to think of it, or say of it. Learns that he is the restorer of French liberty, as a statue of him, to be raised on the site of the Bastille, shall testify to all men. Finally, he is shown at the balcony, with a tricolor cockade in his hat, is greeted now with vehement acclamation from square and street, from all windows and roofs, and so drives home again, amid glad, mingled, and, as it were, intermarried shouts of Vive le Roy and Vive la Nation, wearied but safe. It was Sunday when the red-hot balls hung over us, in mid-air. It is now but Friday, and the revolution is sanctioned. An august National Assembly shall make the Constitution, and neither foreign pandor, domestic triumvirate, with leveled cannon, Guy Fawkes powder plots, for that too was spoken of, nor any tyrannic power on the earth, or under the earth, shall say to it, What dost thou? So jubilates the people, sure now of a constitution. Cracked Marquis Saint-Herouge is heard under the windows of the chateau, 
murmuring sheer speculative treason. End of section 34section thirty five of the french revolution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by anna simon the french revolution by thomas carlyle volume one book five chapter nine the lantern the fall of the Bastille may be said to have shaken all France to the deepest foundations of its existence. The rumour of these wonders flies everywhere. With the natural spread of rumour, with an effect thought to be preternatural, produced by plots. Did D'Orléans or Laclos, nay, did Mirabeau, not overburdened with money at this time, send riding couriers out from Paris to gallop on all radii, or highways, towards all points of France. It is a miracle which no penetrating man will call in question. Already in most towns electoral committees were met, to regret Necker in harangue and resolution. In many a town, as Rennes, Caen, Lyon, an ebullient people was already regretting him in brickbats and musketry. But now, at every town's end in France, there do arrive, in these days of terror, men, as men will arrive, nay, men on horseback, since rumour oftenest travels riding. These men declare, with alarmed countenance, the brigands to be coming, to be just at hand, and do then ride on, about their further business, be what it might. Whereupon the whole population of such town defensively flies to arms. Petition is soon thereafter forwarded to National Assembly. In such peril and terror of peril, leave to organize yourself cannot be withheld. The armed population becomes everywhere an enrolled National Guard. Thus writes rumor, careering along all radii, from Paris outwards, to such purpose. In few days, some say in not many hours, all France, to the utmost borders, bristles with bayonets. Singular, but undeniable, miraculous or not, but thus may any chemical liquid, though cool to the freezing point, or far lower, still continue liquid, and then, on the slightest stroke or shake, it at once rushes wholly into ice. Thus has France, for long months and even years, been chemically dealt with, brought below zero, and now, shaken by the fall of a Bastille, it instantaneously congeals into one crystallized mass of sharp cutting steel. Kea chila toca, where who touches it? In Paris, an electoral committee, with a new mayor and general, is urgent with belligerent workmen to resume their handicrafts. Strong dames of the market, Dame de la Halle, deliver congratulatory harangues, present bouquets to the shrine of St. Genevieve. Unenrolled men deposit their arms, not so readily as could be wished, and receive nine francs. With to dames, royal visits, and sanctioned revolution, there is halcyon weather, weather even of preternatural brightness, the hurricane being overblown. Nevertheless, as is natural, the waves still run high, hollow rocks retaining their murmur. We are but at the twenty-second of the month, hardly above a week since the Bastille fell, when it suddenly appears that old Foulon is alive, nay, that he is here in early morning in the streets of Paris. The extortioner, the plotter, who would make the people eat grass, and was a liar from the beginning. It is even so. The deceptive, sumptuous funeral of some domestic that died, the hiding-place at Vitry towards Fontainebleau, have not availed that wretched old man. Some living domestic or dependent, for none loves Foulon, has betrayed him to the village. Merciless boors of Vitry unearth him, pounce on him like hellhounds. Westward, old infamy! To Paris, to be judged at Hôtel de Ville. His old head, which seventy-four years have bleached, 
is bare. They have tied an emblematic bundle of grass on his back. A garland of nettles and thistles is round his neck. In this manner, led with robes, goaded on with curses and menaces, must he with his old limbs sprawl forward, the pitiablest, most unpitied of all old men. Suti Saint Antoine and every street mustering its crowds as he passes. The Place de Grève, the hall of the Hôtel de Ville, will scarcely hold his escort and him. Foulon must not only be judged righteously, but judged there where he stands without any delay. Appoint seven judges, ye municipals, or seventy and seven. Name them yourselves, or we will name them, but judge him. Electoral rhetoric, eloquence of Mayor Bailly, is wasted explaining the beauty of the law's delay. Delay and still delay. Behold, O Mayor of the people, the morning has worn itself into noon, and he is still unjudged. Lafayette, pressingly sent for, arrives, gives voice. This Foulon, a known man, is guilty almost beyond doubt. But may he not have accomplices? Ought not the truth to be cunningly pumped out of him, in the Abai prison? It is a new light. Sans culottism claps hands. At which hand-clapping, Foulon, in his feigness, as his destiny would have it, also claps. See, they understand one another, cries dark sans culottism, blazing into fury of suspicion. Friends, said a person in good clothes, stepping forward, what is the use of judging this man? Has he not been judged these thirty years? With wild yells, sans culottism clutches him in its hundred hands. He is whirled across the Place de Grève to the lantern lamp-iron which there is at the corner of the rue de la vannerie pleading bitterly for life to the deaf winds only with the third rope for two ropes broke and the quavering voice still pleaded can he be so much as got hanged his body is dragged through the streets his head goes aloft on a pike the mouth filled with grass amid sounds as of topfe from a grass-eating people Surely, if revenge is a kind of justice, it is a wild kind. O oh, mad sansculottism, hast thou risen in thy mad darkness, in thy suit and rags, unexpectedly, like an enchilados, living buried from under his chinacria? They that would make grass be eaten do now eat grass in this manner. After long, dumb groaning generations, has the turn suddenly become thine? To such abysmal overturns and frightful instantaneous inversions of the centre of gravity are human solecisms all liable, if they but knew it. The more liable, the falser and top-heavier they are. To add to the horror of Mayor Pays and his municipals, word comes that Berthier has also been arrested, that he is on his way hither from Compiègne. Berthier, intendant, say, tax levier of Paris, sycophant and tyrant, forestaller of corn, contriver of camps against the people, accused of many things. Is he not Foulon's son-in-law, and, in that one point, guilty of all? In these hours, too, when sansculottism has its blood up, the shuddering municipals send one of their number to escort him with mounted national guards. At the fall of day, the wretched Berthier, still wearing a face of courage, arrives at the barrier, in an open carriage, with a municipal beside him, five hundred horsemen with drawn sabres, unarmed footmen enough, not without noise. Placards go brandished round him, bearing legibly his indictment, as sansculottism with unlegal brevity, in huge letters, draws it up. Il a vol le roi et la France. He robbed the king and France. He devoured the substance of the people. He was the slave of the rich and a tyrant of the poor. He drank the blood of the widow and orphan. He betrayed his country. Paris is come forth to meet him, with hand-clappings, with windows flung up, with dances, triumph songs, as of the Furies. Lastly, the head of Foulon, 
this also meets him on a pike. Well might his look become glazed and sense fail him at such sight. Nevertheless, be the man's conscience what it may, his nerves are of iron. At the Hôtel de Ville he will answer nothing. He says he obeyed superior order, they have his papers, they may judge and determine. As for himself, not having closed an eye these two nights, he demands, before all things, to have sleep. Leaden sleep, thou miserable Berthier. Guards rise with him in motion towards the abbaye. At the very door of the Hôtel de Ville they are clutched, flung asunder, as by a vortex of mad arms. Berthier whirls towards the lantern. He snatches a musket, fells and strikes, defending himself like a mad lion, is borne down, trampled, hanged, mangled. His head, too, and even his heart, flies over the city on a pike. Horrible in lands that had known equal justice. Not so unnatural in lands that had never known it. Le sang qui coule est-il donc si pur? asks Barnave, intimating that the gallows, though by irregular methods, has its own. Thou thyself, O reader, when thou turnest that corner of the Rue de la Vannerie, and discernest still that same grim bracket of old iron, will not want for reflections. Over a grocer's shop, or otherwise, with a bust of Louis the Fourteenth in the niche under it, or now no longer in the niche, it still sticks there, still holding out an ineffectual light of fish oil, and has seen worlds wrecked and says nothing. But to the eye of enlightened patriotism, what a thundercloud was this, suddenly shaping itself in the radiance of the halcyon weather! Cloud of Erebus blackness, betokening latent electricity without limit. Mayor Bailly, General Lafayette, throw up their commissions in an indignant manner, need to be flattered back again. The cloud disappears as thunder clouds do. The halcyon weather returns, though of a greyer complexion of a character more and more evidently not supernatural. Thus, in any case, with what rubs soever, shall the Bastille be abolished from our earth, and with it feudalism, despotism, and, one hopes, scoundrelism generally, and all hard usage of man by his brother man. Alas, the scoundrelism and hard usage are not so easy of abolition, but as for the Bastille, it sinks day after day and month after month. Its ashlers and boulders tumbling down continually by express order of our municipals. Crowds of the curious roam through its caverns, gaze on the skeletons found walled up, on the oubliettes, iron cages, monstrous stone blocks with padlocked chains. One day we discern Mirabeau there, along with the Genevese Dumont. Workers and onlookers make reverent way for him fling verses, flowers on his path, Bastille papers and curiosities into his carriage, with vivats. Able editors compile books from the Bastille archives, from what of them remain unburned. The key of that robber den shall cross the Atlantic, shall lie on Washington's hall table. The great clock ticks now in a private, patriotic, clockmaker's apartment, no longer measuring hours of mere heaviness. Vanished is the Bastille, what we call vanished, the body or sandstones of it hanging in benign metamorphosis for centuries to come over the Seine waters, as Pont Louis says, the soul of it living, perhaps still longer, in the memories of man. So far, ye august senators, with your tennis court oaths, your inertia and impetus, your sagacity and pertinacity, have you brought us. And yet, think, messieurs, as the petitioner justly urged, you who were our saviors did yourselves need saviors. The brave Bastiers, namely, workmen of Paris, many of them in straitened pecuniary circumstances. Subscriptions are opened, lists are formed, more accurate than Eli's, harangues are delivered. A body of Bastille heroes, tolerably complete, did get together comparable to the Argonauts, hoping to endure like them. But in little more than a year, the whirlpool of things threw them asunder again, and they sank. So many highest superlatives achieved by man 
are followed by new higher, and dwindle into comparatives and positives. The siege of the Bastille, weighed with which, in the historical balance, most other sieges, including that of Troy Town, are gossamer, cost, as we find, in killed and mortally wounded on the part of the besiegers, some eighty-three persons, on the part of the besieged, after all that straw-burning, fire-pumping, and deluge of musketry, one poor solitary invalid shot stone dead, what more, on the battlements. The Bastille fortress, like the city of Jericho, was overturned by miraculous sound. End of section 35《Section 36 of the French Revolution》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Geoffrey Church The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle Volume 1, Book 6, Chapter 1 Make the Constitution Here perhaps is the place to fix a little more precisely what these two words, French Revolution, shall mean. For, strictly considered, they may have as many meanings as there are speakers of them. All things are in revolution, in change from moment to moment, which becomes sensible from epoch to epoch. In this time world of ours, there's properly nothing else but revolution and mutation, and even nothing else conceivable. Revolution, you answer, means speedier change, whereupon one still has to ask how speedy, at what degree of speed, and what particular points of this variable course which varies in velocity but can never stop till time itself stops, does revolution begin and end, cease to be ordinary mutation, and again become such. It is a thing that will depend on definition more or less arbitrary, for ourselves, we answer that French Revolution means here the open, violent rebellion and victory of disimprisoned anarchy against corrupt, worn-out authority. How anarchy breaks prison, bursts up from the infinite deep, and rages uncontrollable, immeasurable, enveloping a world, and faces after faces of fever frenzy, till the frenzy burning itself out and what elements of new order it held developing themselves, the uncontrollable begot, if not imprisoned, yet harnessed, and its mad forces made to work towards their object, the sane and regulated ones. For as hierarchies and dynasties of all kinds, theocracies, aristocracies, autocracies, strumpetocracies, have ruled over the world, so it was appointed, in the decrees of providence, that the same victorious anarchy, Jacobinism, Sanculottism, French Revolution, horrors of the French Revolution, or whatever else mortals name it, should have its turn. The destructive wrath of Sanculottism, this is what we speak, having unhappily no voice for singing. Surely a great phenomenon. Nay, it is a transcendental one, overstepping all rules and experience, the crowning phenomenon of our modern time. For here again, most unexpectedly, comes antique fanaticism in new and newest vesture, miraculous as all fanaticism is. Call it the fanaticism of making away with formulas. De humer les formulas, the world of formulas, the formed, regulated world, which all habitable world is, must needs hate such fanaticism like death, and be at deadly variance with it. The world of formulas must conquer it, or failing that, must die execrating it, anathematizing it, can nevertheless in no wise prevent its being and having been. The anathemas are there, and the miraculous thing is there. Whence it cometh, whither it goeth, these are questions. When the age of miracles lay faded into the distance as an incredible tradition, and even the age of conventionalities was old, and man's existence had gone long for long generations rested on mere formulas which were grown hollow, of course, by time, 
and it seemed as if no reality any longer existed, but only phantasms of realities. And God's universe were the work of the tailor and upholsterer mainly, and men were buckram masks that went about beckoning and grimacing there. On a sudden, the earth yawns asunder, and amid Tartarian smoke, and then glare of fierce brightness, rises sans many-headed fire-breathing, and asks, What think ye of me? Well may the buckram masks start together, terror-struck, into expressive, well-concerted groups. It is indeed, friends, a most singular, most fatal thing. Let whoever is but buckram in a phantasm look to it. Ill verily may it fare with him. Here methinks he cannot much longer be. Woe also to many a one who is not wholly buckram, but partially real and human. The age of miracles has come back. Behold the world, Phoenix, in fire consummation and fire creation. Wide are her fanning wings. Loud is her death melody of battle thunders and falling towns. Skyward lashes the funeral flame enveloping all things. It is the death birth of a world. Whereby, however, as we often say, shall one unspeakable bliss seem attainable. This, namely, that man and his life rest no more on hollowness and a life, but on solidity and some kind of truth. Welcome the beggarliest truth, so it be one in exchange for the royalist sham. Truth of any kind breeds ever new and better truth. Thus hard granite rock will crumble down into soil under the blessed skyey influences and cover itself with verdure, with fruitage and umbrage. But as for falsehood, which is like contrary manner, grows ever falser, what can it, or what should it do but decrease, being ripe, decompose itself, gently or even violently, and return to the father of it, too probably in flames of fire. Sanculotism will burn much, but what is incombustible it will not burn. Fear not, sanculotism. Recognize it for what it is, the portentous inevitable end of much, the miraculous beginning of much. One other thing thou mayest understand of it, that it too came from God. For has it not been? From of old, as it is written, are his goings forth, in the great deep of things, fearful and wonderful now as in the beginning. In the whirlwind also he speaks, and the wrath of men is made to praise him. But to gauge and measure this immeasurable thing, and what is called account for it, and reduce it to a death logic formula, attempt not, much less shall thou shriek thyself hoarse, cursing it. For that, to all needful things, has been already done. As an actually existing son of time, look with unspeakable manifold interest, oftenest in silence at what the time did bring, therewith edify, instruct, nourish thyself, or were it but to amuse and gratify thyself, as it is given thee. Another question which at every new turn will rise on us, requiring ever new reply, is this. Where the French Revolution specifically is, in the king's palace, in his majesty or her majesty's managements and maltreatments, cabals, imbecilities, and woes, answer some few, whom we do not answer. In the National Assembly, answer a large, mixed multitude who accordingly seat themselves in the reporter's chair, and therefrom noting what proclamations, acts, reports, passages of logic fence, bursts of parliamentary eloquence seem notable within doors, and what tumults and rumors of tumult become audible from without, produce volume on volume, and naming it History of the French Revolution, contentedly publish the same. To do the like, to almost any extent, with so many filed newspapers, choix de rapport, 
histoire parlementaire as they are, amounting to many horse loads, were easy for us. Easy but unprofitable. The National Assembly, named now Constituent Assembly, goes its course, making the Constitution. But the French Revolution also goes its course. In general, may we not say that the French Revolution lies in the heart and head of every violent speaking, of every violent thinking Frenchman? How the twenty-five millions of such, in their perplexed combination, acting and counteracting, may give birth to events, which event successively is the cardinal one, and from what point of vision it may best be surveyed, this is the problem. Which problem the best insight, seeking light from all possible sources, shifting its point of vision whithersoever vision or glimpse of vision can be had, may employ itself in solving, and be well content to solve it in some tolerably approximate way. As to the National Assembly, in so far as it still towers, eminent over France, after the manner of a car-born carocchio, though now no longer in the van, and rings signals for retreat or for advance, it is and continues a reality among other realities, but in so far as it sits making the constitution, on the other hand, it is a fatuity and chimera mainly. Alas, in the never so heroic building of Montesquieu Mably card castles, though shouted over by the world, what interest is there? Occupied in that way, an august national assembly becomes for us little other than a Sanhedrin of pedants, not of the gerund grinding, yet of no fruitful sort. And its loud debatings and recriminations about the rights of man, rights of peace and war, veto suspensif, veto absolute, and what are they but so many pedants' curses? May God confound you for your theory of irregular verbs. A constitution can be built. Constitutions enough, a la Sies. But the frightful difficulty is that of getting men to come and live in them. Could Sies have drawn thunder and lightning out of heaven to sanction his constitution? It had been well. But without any thunder? Nay, strictly considered... Is it not still true that without some such celestial sanction, given visibly in thunder or invisibly otherwise, no constitution can in the long run be worth much more than the waste paper it is written on? The constitution, the set of laws, or the prescribed habits of acting that men will live under is the one which images their convictions, their faith as it's to this wondrous universe, and what rights, duties, capabilities they have there, which stands sanctioned, therefore, by necessity itself, if not by a seen deity, then by an unseen one. Other laws, whereof there are always enough ready-made, are usurpations, which men do not obey, but rebel against and abolish by their earliest convenience. The question of questions accordingly were, who is it that especially for rebellers and abolishers can make a constitution? He that can image forth the general belief when there is one, that can impart one when, as here, there is none? A most rare man, ever as of old a god mission van. Here, however, in defect of such transcendent supreme man, time with its infinite succession of merely superior men, each yielding his little contribution, does much. Force likewise will all along find somewhat to do, and thus in perpetual abolition and reparation, rending and mending, with struggle and strife, with present evil and the hope and effort towards future good, must the Constitution, as all human things do, build itself forward, or unbuild itself, sink as it can and may, O C S, and ye other com committee men, and twelve hundred miscellaneous individuals from all parts of France. What is the belief of France, and yours, if ye knew it, properly, that there shall be no belief, that all formulas be swallowed? The Constitution, which will suit that? Alas, too clearly a no-constitution, an anarchy, 
which also in due season shall be vouchsafed you. But after all, what can unf an unfortunate National Assembly do? Consider only this, that there are 1,200 miscellaneous individuals, not a unit of whom but has his own thinking apparatus, his own speaking apparatus. In every unit of them is some belief and wish different for each, both that France should be regenerated and also that he individually should do it. 1,200 separate forces yoked miscellaneously to any object, miscellaneously to all sides of it, and bid pull for life. Or is it the nature of national assemblies generally to do, with endless labor and clangor, nothing? Are representative governments, mostly at bottom, tyrannies too? Shall we say, the tyrants, the ambitious, contentious persons from all corners of the country do, in this manner, get gathered into one place, and there, with motion and counter-motion, with jargon and hubbub, cancel one another, like the fabulous Kilkenny cats, and produce, for net result, zero. The country, meanwhile, governing or guiding itself by such wisdom, recognized or for the most part unrecognized, as may exist in individual heads here and there. Nay, even that were a great improvement, for of old, with the, their gulf factions and ghibelline factions, with their red roses and white roses, they were wont to cancel the whole country as well. Besides, they do it now in a much narrower cockpit, within the four walls of their assembly house, and here and there an outpost of hustings and barrelheads. Do it with tongues, too, not with swords, all of which improvements in the art of producing zero. Are they not great? Nay, best of all, some happy continents can do without governing. What sphinx questions, which the distracted world in these very generations must answer or die? End of section 36 Recording by Jeffrey Church. Section 37 of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Church. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1. Book Six, Chapter Two, The Constituent Assembly. One thing an elected assembly of twelve hundred is fit for: destroying, which indeed is but a more decided exercise of its natural talent for doing nothing. Do nothing, only keep agitating, debating, and things will destroy themselves. So and not otherwise proved it with the august National Assembly. It took the name constituent as if its mission and function had been to construct or build, which also, with its whole soul, it endeavored to do. Yet, in the fates, in the nature of things, there lay for it precisely of all the functions the most opposite of that. Singular, what gospels men will believe, even gospels according to Jean-Jacques. It was the fixed faith of those national deputies, as if of all thinking Frenchmen, that the Constitution could be made, that they, there and then, were called to make it. How, with the toughness of old Hebrews or Ishmaelite Muslim, did the otherwise light unbelieving people persist in this their credo, quia impossibile, and front the armed world with it, and grow fanatic, and even heroic, and do exploits by it? The Constituent Assembly's Constitution, and several others, will, being printed and not manuscript, survive to future generations as an instructive, well-nigh incredible document of the time. The most significant picture of the then-existing France, or at its lowest, picture of these men's picture of it. But in truth and seriousness, what could the National Assembly have done? The thing to be done was, actually, as they say, to regenerate France, to abolish the old France, and make a new one, quietly or forcibly, by concession or by violence, 
This, by the law of nature, has become inevitable. With what degree of violence depends on the wisdom of those that preside over it. With perfect wisdom on the part of the National Assembly, it had all been otherwise. But whether in any wise it could have been pacific, nay, other than bloody and convulsive, may still be a question. Grant, meanwhile, that this constituent assembly does to the last continue to be something. With a sigh, it sees itself incessantly forced away from its infinite divine task of perfecting the theory of irregular verbs, to finite terrestrial tasks, which latter have still significance for us. It is the cynosure of revolutionary France, this National Assembly. All work of government has fallen into its hands, or under its control. All men look to it for guidance. In the middle of that huge revolt of 25 millions, it hovers always aloft as Carroccio or battle standard, impelling and impelled in the most confused way. If it cannot give much guidance, it will still seem to give some. It emits pacificatory proclamations, not a few, with more or less results. It authorizes the enrollment of National Guards lest brigands come to devour us and reap the unripe crops. It sends missions to quell effervescences, to deliver men for the lantern. It can listen to congratulatory addresses, which arrive daily by the sackful, mostly in King Cambus's vein, also to petitions and complaints from all mortals, so that every mortal's complaint if it cannot get redressed, may at least hear itself complain. For the rest, an august National Assembly can produce parliamentary eloquence and appoint committees, committees of the Constitution, of reports, of researches, and of much else, which again yield mountains of print, printed paper. The theme of new parliamentary eloquence in bursts, nor in plenteous, smooth-flowing floods, and so, from the waste vortex whereon all things go whirling and grinding, organic laws, or the similitude of such, slowly emerge. With endless debating, we get the rights of man written down and promulgated, true paper basis of all paper constitutions. Neglecting cry the opponents to declare the duties of man, Forgetting, answer we, to ascertain the mights of man, one of the fatalist admissions. Nay, sometimes, as on the 4th of August, our National Assembly, fired suddenly by an almost preternatural enthusiasm, will get through the whole masses of work in one night. A memorable night, this 4th of August, dignitaries temporal and spiritual, peers, archbishops, parliament, presidents, each outdoing the other in patriotic devotedness, come successfully to throw their untenable possessions on the altar of the fatherland. With louder and la louder vivant, for indeed it is after dinner too, they abolish tithes, seigneurial dues, gabelle, excessive preservation of game, nay privilege, immunity, feudalism, root and branch, then appoint a te diem for it and so finally disperse about three in the morning, striking the stars with their sublime heads. Such night, unforeseen but forever memorable, was this of the 4th of August, 1789. Miraculous or semi-miraculous, some seem to think of it. A new night of Pentecost, shall we say, shaped according to the new time, the new church of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. It has its causes, now also its effects. In such manner labor the national deputies, perfecting their theory of irregular verbs, governing France and being governed by it, with toil and noise, cutting asunder ancient intolerable bonds, and for new ones, assiduously spinning ropes of sand, where their labors a nothing or a something, and yet the eyes of all France being reverently fixed on them, history can never very long leave them altogether out of sight. For the present, if we glance into that assembly hall of theirs, it will be found, as is natural, most irregular. As many a, as 
a hundred members are on their feet at once. No rule in making motions, or only commencements of a rule. Spectators gallery allowed to applaud or even to hiss. President appointed once a fortnight, raising many times no serene head ab above the waves. Nevertheless, as in all human assemblages, like does begin arranging itself to like, the perennial rule, ubi homine, homines sunt modi sunt, proves valid. Rudiments of methods disclose themselves, rudiments of parties. There is a right side, code droit, a left side, code gauche, sitting on Monsieur le Président's right hand or on his left, the code droit conservative, the code gauche destructive. Intermediate is Anglomaniac constitutionalism, or two-chamber royalism, with its munier, its lallies, fast verging towards non-entity. Preeminent on the right side pleads and perorates Casales, dragoon captain, eloquent, mildly fervent, earning for himself the shadow of a name. There are also blusters Barrel Mirabeau, the younger Mirabeau, not without wit. Dusky Despremeniel does nothing but sniff and ejaculate. Might, it is fondly thought, lay prostrate the elder Mirabeau himself, would he but try, which he does not. Last and greatest see for the moment the Abbe Maury, with his Jesuitic eyes, his impassive brass face, image of all the cardinal sins. Indomitable, unquenchable, he fights Jesuitico rhetorically, with toughest lungs and heart, for throne, especially for altar and tithes, so that a shrill voice exclaims once from the gallery, Monsieur of the clergy, you have to be shaved. If you wriggle too much, you will get cut. The left side is also called the Dorléans side, and sometimes derisively the Palais Royal. And yet, so confused, real imaginary seems everything. It is doubtful, as Mirabeau said, whether Dorléans himself belongs to that same Dorléans party. What can be known and seen is that his moon visage does beam forth from that point of space. There likewise sits sea-green Robespierre, throwing in his light weight, with decision not yet with effect. A thin, lean Puritan, Prisian, he would make away with formulas, yet lives, moves, and has his being, wholly in formulas of another sort. People, such according to Robespierre, ought to be the royal method of promulgating laws. People, this is, this is the law I have framed for thee. Dost thou accept it? Answered from the right side, from center and left, by inextinguishable laughter. Yet men of insight discern that the sea green may by chance go far. This man, observes Mirobo, will do somewhat. He believes every word he says. Abbe Sihez is busy with mere constitutional work, wherein, unluckily, fellow workmen are less pitiable than with one who has completed the science of polity. They ought to be. Courage, Sihez, nonetheless. Some twenty months of heroic travail, of contradiction from the stupid, and the constitution shall be built the top stone of it brought out with shouting, say rather the top paper, for it is all paper, and thou hast done in it what the earth or the heaven could require, thy utmost. Note likewise this trio, memorable for several things, memorable were it only that their history is written in an epigram. Whatsoever these three have in hand, it is said, Duport thinks it, Barnave speaks it, Lameth does it. But Royal Mirabeau, conspicuous among all parties, raised above and beyond them all, this man rises more and more. As we often say, he has an eye, he is a reality, while others are formulas and eyeglasses. In the transient he will detect the perennial, find some firm footing even among paper vortexes, his fame has gone forth to all lands. It gladdened the heart of the crabbed old friend of men himself before he died. The very 
postillion of inns have heard of Mirabeau. When an impatient traveller complains that the team is insufficient, his postillion answers, Yes, monsieur, the wheelers are weak, but my Mirabeau, main horse, you see, is a right one. Mais mon Mirabeau is excellent. And now, reader, thou shalt quit this noisy discrepancy of a national assembly, not, if thou be of humane mind, without pity. Twelve hundred brother men are there, in the centre of twenty-five millions, fighting so fiercely with fate and with one another, struggling their lives out, as most sons of Adam do, for that which profiteth not. Nay, on the whole, it is admitted further to be very dull. Dull is this day's assembly, said someone. Why date? Pourquoi de terre? answered Michobo. Consider that they are twelve hundred, that they not only speak, but read their speeches, and even borrow and steal speeches to read. With twelve hundred fluent speakers, and their Noah's deluge of vociferous commonplace unattainable silence, may well seem the one blessing of life. But figure twelve hundred pamphleteers droning forth perpetual pamphlets, and no man to gag them. Neither, as in the American Congress, do the arrangements seem perfect. A senator has not his own desk and newspaper here, of tobacco, much less of pipes. There is not the slightest provision. Conversation itself must be transacted in a low tone, with continual interruption. Only pencil notes circulate freely in incredible numbers to the foot of the very tribune. Such work is it, regenerating a nation, perfecting one's theory of irregular verbs. End of section 37. Recording by Jeffrey Church. Section 38 of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Geoffrey Church. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 6, Chapter 3. The General Overturn. Of the King's Court, for the present, there is almost nothing whatsoever to be said. Silent, deserted are these halls. Royalty languishes, forsaken of its war god and all its hopes, till once the Ouille de Bouffe rally again. The scepter is departed from King Louis, is gone over to the Salle de Menu, to the Paris town hall, or one knows not whither. In the July days, while all ears were yet deafened by the crash of the Bastille, and ministers and princes were scattered to the four winds, it seemed as if the very valet had grown heavy of hearing. Bissenval, also in flight towards infinite space, but hovering a little at Versailles, was addressing his majesty personally for an order about post-horses, when, lo, the valet in waiting places himself familiarly between his majesty and me, stretching out his rascal neck to learn what it was, his majesty in sudden collar whirled around, made a clutch of the tongues. I gently prevented him. He grasped my hand in thankfulness, and I noticed tears in his eyes. Poor king, the French kings also are men. Louis XIV himself once clutched the tongues, and even smote with them. But then it was at Louvois, and Dame Maintenon ran up. The queen sits weeping in her inner apartments, surrounded by weak women. She is at the height of unpopularity, universally regarded as the evil genius of France. Her friends and familiar counsellors have all fled, and fled surely on the foolishest other errand. The Chateau Polignac still frowns aloft on its bold and enormous cubicle rock, amid the blooming champagnes, amid the blue girdling mountains of Auvergne. But no duke and duchess Polignac look forth from it. 
They have fled. They have met Necker at Bâle, and they shall not return. That France should see her nobles resist the irresistible, inevitable, with the face of angry men, was unhappy, not unexpected. But with the face and sense of pettish children, this was her peculiarity. They understood nothing, would understand nothing. Does not at this hour a new Polignac, first born of these two, sit reflective in the ha castle of Ham, in an astonishment he will never recover from, the most confused of existing mortals? King Louis has his new ministry, mere popularities, old President Pompignan, Necker, come back in triumph, and other such. But what will it avail him? As was said, the scepter, all but the wooden gilt scepter, has departed else whither. Volition, determination is not in this man. Only innocence, indolence, dependence on all persons but himself, on all circumstances but the circumstances he were lord of. So troublous internally is our Versailles and its work. Beautiful, if seen from afar, resplendent like a sun. See near at hand a mere sun's atmosphere, hiding darkness, confused ferment of ruin. But over France there goes on the indisputablest destruction of formulas, transactions of realities that follow therefrom. So many millions of persons, all jived and nigh strangled with formulas, whose life nevertheless, at least the digestion and hunger of it, was real enough. Heaven has at length sent an abundant harvest, but what profits it, the poor man, when earth with her formulas interposes? Industry, in these times of inner insurrection, must needs lie dormant. Capital, as usual, not circulating, but stagnating timorously in nooks. The poor man is short of work, is therefore short of money. Nay, even had he money, bread is not to be bought for it. Were it plotting of aristocrats, plotting of Dorlian, were it brigands, preternatural terror, and the clang of Phoebus Apollo's silver bow, enough. The markets are scarce of grain, plentiful only in tumult. Farmers seem lazy to thresh, being either bribed or needing no bribe, with prices ever rising, with perhaps rent itself no longer pressing. Neither what is singular do municipal enactments, that along with so many measures of wheat you shall set so many of rye, and other the like, much mend the matter. Dragoons with drawn swords stand ranked among the corn sacks, often more dragoons than sacks. Meal mobs abound, growing into mobs of a still darker quality. Starvation has been known among the French commonality before this. Known and familiar. Did we not see them in the year 1775 presenting in sallow faces, in wretchedness and raggedness, their petition of grievances, and, for answer, getting a brand new gallows forty feet high? Hunger and darkness through long years. For look back on that earlier Paris riot, where a great personage, worn out by debauchery, was believed to be in want of blood baths and mothers in worn raiment, yet with living hearts under it, filled the public places with their wild Rachel cries, stilled also by the gallows. Twenty years ago, the friend of men described Limousin peasants as wearing a pain-stricken look, a look past complaint, as if the oppression of the great were like the hail and the thunder, a thing irredeemable, the ordinance of nature. And now, if in some great hour the shock of a falling Bastille should awaken you, and it were found to be the ordinance of art merely, the remediable, reversible? Or has the reader forgotten that the flood of savages, which in sight of the same friend of men, descended from the mountains of Mount Dor? Lank-haired, haggard faces, shapes raw-boned and high sabbats, 
in woolen jupes with leather girdles studded with copper nails. They rocked from foot to foot, and beat time with their elbows too, as the quarrel and battle which was not long in the beginning went on, shouting fiercely, the lank faces distorted in the similitude of a cruel laugh. For they were darkened and hardened, long had they been the prey of excisemen and taxmen, of clerks with the cold spurt of their pen. It was the fixed prophecy of our old Marquis, which no man would listen to, that such government by blind man's buff, stumbling along too far, would end by the general overturn, the colbut général. No man would listen, each went his thoughtless way, and time and destiny also traveled on. The government by blind man's buff, stumbling along, had reached the precipice inevitable for it. Dull drudgery, driven on by clerks with the cold, dastard spurt of their pen, has been driven into a communion of drudges. For now, moreover, there have come the strangest confused tidings by Paris journals with their paper wings, or still more portentous, where no journals are, by rumor and conjecture. Oppression not inevitable, a Bastille prostrate, and the Constitution fast getting ready. Which Constitution, if it be something and not nothing, what can it be but bread to eat? The traveler, walking uphill, bridle in hand, overtakes a poor woman. The image, as such commonly are, are dr of drudgery and scarcity, looking sixty years of age, though she is not yet twenty-eight. They have seven children, her poor drudge and she, a farm with only one cow, which helps to make the children soup, also one little horse or garron. They have rents and quit rents, hens to pay to the seigneur, oat sacks to that, king's taxes, statute labor, church taxes, taxes enough, and think the times inexpressible. She has heard that somewhere, in some manner, something is to be done for the poor. God send it soon, for the dues and taxes crush us down. Fair prophecies are spoken, but they are not fulfilled. There have been notables, assemblages, turnings out and comings in, intriguing and maneuvering, parliamentary eloquence and arguing, Greek meeting Greek in high places, has long gone on. Yet still bread comes not. The harvest is reaped and garnered, yet still we have no bread. Urged by despair and by hope, what can drudgery do but rise, as predicted and produce the general overturn? Fancy, then, some five full-grown millions of such gaunt figures, with their haggard faces, in woolen jupes, with copper-studded leather girths and high sabots, starting up to ask, as if, in forest roarings, their washed upper classes after long unreviewed centuries, virtually this question, how have ye treated us? How have ye taught us, fed us, and led us while we toiled for you? The answer can be read in flames over this nightly summer sky. This is the feeding and leading we have of you. Emptiness of pocket, of stomach, of head, and of heart. Behold, there is nothing in us, nothing but what nature gives her wild children of the desert. Ferocity and appetite, strength grounded on hunger. Did ye mark among your rights of man that man was not to die of starvation while there was bread reaped by him? It is among the mites of man. Seventy-two chateaus have flamed aloft in the Maconnais and Beaujolais alone. This seems the center of the conflagration, but it has spread over Dauphine, Alsace, the Lyonnais, the whole southeast is in blaze. All over the north, from Rouen to Metz, disorder is abroad. Smugglers of salt go openly in armed bands. The barriers of towns are burnt. Toll gatherers, tax gatherers, official persons put to flight. It was thought, says Young, the people from hunger would revolt, and we see they have done it. 
desperate lackalls, long prowling, aimless, now finding hope and desperation itself, everywhere form a nucleus. They ring the church bell by way of toxin, and the parish turns out to the work. Ferocity, atrocity, hunger, and revenge, such work as we can imagine. Ill stands it now with the seigneur, who, for example, has walled up the only fountain of the township, who has ridden high on his ch chatier and parchments, who has preserved gain not wisely but too well. Churches also and canonry are sacked without mercy, which have shorn the flock too close for getting defeated. Woe to the land over which Saint Coulottism, in its day of vengeance, tramps roughshod, shod in the sabbats. High-bred seniors with their delicate women and little ones had to fly half-naked under clouds of night, glad to escape the flames and even worse. You meet them at the table d'hôte of inns, making wise reflections or foolish that rank is destroyed, uncertain whither they, would now, they shall now wend. The mater will find it convenient to be slack in paying rent. As for the tax gatherer, he long hunting as a biped of prey may now get hunted as one. His Majesty's exchequer will not fill up the deficit this season. It is the notion of many that a patriot Majesty, being the restorer of French liberty, has abolished most taxes, though for their private ends some men make a secret of it. Where will this end? In the abyss, one may prophesy? whither all delusions are, at all moments traveling, where this delusion has now arrived. For if there be a faith from of old, it is this, as we often repeat, that no lie can live forever. The very truth has to change its vesture from time to time and can be born again. But all lies have sentence of death written down against them, and heaven's chancery itself and slowly or fast advanced incessantly towards their hour. The sign of a grand seigneur being landlord, says the vehement plain-spoken Arthur Young, our wastes, lands, deserts, ling, go to his residence. You will find it in the middle of the forest, peopled with deer, wild boars, and wolves. The fields are scenes of pitiable management, as the houses are of misery. To see so many millions of hands that would be industrious, all idle and starving. Oh, if I were a legislator of France for one day, I would make these great lords skip again. O oh, Arthur, thou, ha thou now actually beholdest them skip. Wilt thou grow to grumble at that too? For long years and generations it lasted, but the time came. Feather brain whom no reasoning and no pleading could touch, the glare of the firebrand had to illuminate. There remained but that method. Consider it, look at it. The widow is gathering nettles for her children's dinner, a perfumed seigneur, delicately lounging at the oeil de boeuf, as an alchemy whereby he will extract from her the third nettle and name it rent and law. Such an arrangement must end. Ought it? But, almost oh, fearful is such an ending, let those to whom God and his great mercy has granted time and space prepare another and milder one. To women it is a matter of wonder that the seigneurs did not do something to help themselves, say, combine and arm, for there were a hundred and fifty thousand of them, all violent enough. Unhappily, a hundred and fifty thousand scattered over wide provinces divided by mutual ill will, cannot combine. The highest seigneurs, as we have seen, had already emigrated, with a view of putting France to the blush. Neither are arms now the peculiar property of seigneurs, but of every mortal who has ten shillings wherewith to buy a second-hand firelock. Besides, those starving peasants, after all, have not four feet and claws, that you could keep them down permanently in that manner. They are not even of black color. They are mere unwashed seigneurs, and a seigneur too has human bowels. The seigneurs did what they could, 
enrolled in national guards, fled with shrieks, complaining to heaven and earth. One signor, famed Meme of Quince, Quincy, near Vesoul, invited all the rustics of his neighborhood to a banquet, blew up his chateau and them with gunpowder, and instantaneously vanished, no man yet knows whither. Some half dozen years back, he came back and demonstrated that it was by accident. Nor are the authorities idle, though unluckily, all authorities, municipalities, and such like, are in the uncertain transitionary state, getting regenerated from old monarchic to new democratic. No official yet knows clearly what he is. Nevertheless, mayors old or new to gather marechauses, national guards, troops of the line. Justice of the most summary sort is not wanting. The Electoral Committee of Macon, though but a committee goes the length of hanging, for its own behoof as many as twenty. The prevot Dauphine traverses the country with a movable column, with tip staves, gallow ropes, for gallows any tree will serve and suspend its culprit, or thirteen culprits. Unhappy country, how is the fair golden green of the ripe bright year defaced with horrid blackness, black ashes of chateaus, black bodies of gibbeted men. Industry has ceased in it, not sounds of the hammer and saw, but of toxin and alarm drum. The scepter has departed, whither one knows not, breaking itself in pieces, here impotent, there tyrannous. National guards are unskillful and of doubtful purpose. Soldiers are inclined to mutiny. There is danger that they too may quarrel danger that they may agree. Strasbourg has seen riots, a town hall torn to shreds, its archives scattered white on the winds, drunk soldiers embracing drunk citizens for three days, and Mayor Dietrich and Marshal Rochambeau reduced nigh to desperation. Through the middle of all which phenomena has seen on his triumphant transit, escorted through Belfort, for instance, by fifty national horsemen and all military music of the place, Monsieur Necker, returning from Bale, glorious as the meridian, though poor Necker himself partly guesses whither it is leading, one highest culminating day at the Paris town hall with immortal vivance, with wife and daughter kneeling publicly to kiss his hand, with Bessemval's pardon granted, but indeed revoked before sunset, one highest day, but then lower days, and even lower, down even to lowest. Such magic is in a name, and in the want of a name, like some enchanted Mambrino's helmet, essential to victory, comes the savior of France, beshouted, besymboled by the world. Alas, so soon to be disenchanted, to be pitched shamefully over the lists as a barber's basin. Gibbon could wish to show him to any man of solidity who were minded to have the soul burnt out of him and become a caput mortuum by ambition unsuccessful or successful. Another small facus we add, and no more. How in the autumn months our sharp-tempered Arthur has been pestered for some days past by shot lead drops and slugs, rattling five or six times into my chaise and about my ears, all the mob of the country gone out to kill game. It is even so. On the cliffs of Dover, over all the marches of France, there appear this autumn two signs on the earth, emigrant flights of French seigneurs, emigrant winged flights of French game. Finished, one may say, or as good as finished, is the preservation of game on this earth, completed for endless time. What part it had to play in the history of civilization is played plaudite, exiat. In this manner does Saint-Culottism blaze up, illustrating many things, producing among the rest, as we saw on the 4th of August, that semi-miraculous night of Pentecost in the National Assembly, semi-miraculous, which had its causes, and its effects. Feudalism is struck dead, 
not on parchment only, non and by ink, but in very fact, by fire, say, by self-combustion. This conflagration of the southeast will abate, will be got scattered to the west, or else whither, extinguish it will not, till the fuel be all done. End of section 38. Recording by Jeffrey Church. Section 39 of The French Revolution, Volume 1, by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Wayman. The French Revolution, by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 6, Chapter 4, in Q. If we look now at Paris, one thing is too evident, that the baker's shops have got their queues, or tails, their long strings of purchasers arranged in tails, so that the first come be the first served, were the shop once open. This waiting in tail, not seen since the early days of July, again makes its appearance in August. In time we shall see it perfected by practice to the rank almost of an art and the art or quasi-art of standing in tail become one of the characteristics of the Parisian people, distinguishing them from all other peoples whatsoever. But consider, while work itself is so scarce, how a man must not only realize money, but stand waiting, if his wife is too weak to wait and struggle, for half days in the tail, till he get it changed for dear bad bread controversies to the length sometimes of blood and battery must arise in these exasperated queues or if no controversy then it is but one accordant pange lingua of complaint against the powers that be france has begun her long curriculum of hungering instructive and productive beyond academic curriculums which extends over some seven most strenuous years as jean paul says of his own life to a great height shall the business of hungering go or consider in strange contrast the jubilee ceremonies for in general the aspect of paris presents these two features jubilee ceremonials and scarcity of victual processions enough walk in jubilee of young women decked and dizened their ribbons all tricolore moving with song and tabor to the shrine of saint genevieve to thank her that the Bastille is down. The strong men of the market and the strong women fail not with their bouquets and speeches. Abbe Fauché, famed in such work, for Abbe Lefebvre could only distribute powder, blesses tricolor cloth for the National Guard, and makes it a national tricolor flag, victorious or to be victorious in the cause of civil and religious liberty all over the world. Fauché, we say, is the man for te deums and public consecrations, to which, as in this instance of the flag, our National Guard will reply with volleys of musketry, church and cathedral though it be. Feeling Notre Dame with such noisiest fuliginous amen, significant of several things. On the whole, we will say our new Mayor Bailly, our new Commander Lafayette, named also Scipio Americanus, have bought their preferment dear. Bailly rides in gilt state coach with beef eaters and sumptuosity, Camille Desmoulins and others sniffing at him for it. Scipio bestrides the white charger and waves with civic plumes in sight of all France. Neither of them, however, does it for nothing but in truth at an exorbitant rate, at this rate, namely, of feeding Paris, and keeping it from fighting. Out of the city funds, some 17,000 of the utterly destitute are employed digging on Montmartre at tenpence a day, which buys them, at market price, almost two pounds of bad bread. They look very yellow when Lafayette goes to harangue them, the town hall is in travail night and day it must bring forth bread a municipal constitution regulations of all kinds curbs on the sanculotic press above all bread bread 
purveyors prowl the country far and wide with the appetite of lions detect hidden grain purchase open grain by gentle means or forcible must and will find grain a most thankless task and so difficult so dangerous even if a man did gain some trifle by it on the nineteenth of august there is food for one day complaints there are that the food is spoiled and produces an effect on the intestines not corn but plaster of paris which effect on the intestines as well as that smarting in the throat and palate a town hall proclamation warns you to disregard or even to consider as drastic beneficial the mayor of st denis so black was his bread has by a dyspeptic populace been hanged on the lanterne there national guards protect the paris corn market first ten suffice then six hundred busy are ye by ye brissot de Arville, condorcet and ye others for as just hinted there is a municipal constitution to be made too the old bastille electors after some ten days of psalmodying over their glorious victory began to hear it asked in a splenetic tone who put you there they accordingly had to give place not without moanings and audible growlings on both sides to a new larger body specially elected for that post which new body augmented altered then fixed finally at the number of three hundred with the title of town representatives représentants de la commune now sits there rightly portioned into committees assiduous making a constitution at all moments when not seeking flour and such a constitution little short of miraculous one that shall consolidate the revolution the revolution is finished then mayor bailly and all respectable friends of freedom would fain think so your revolution like jelly sufficiently boiled needs only to be poured into shapes of constitution and consolidated therein could it indeed contrive to cool which last however is precisely the doubtful thing or even the not doubtful unhappy friends of freedom consolidating a revolution they must sit at work there their pavilions spread on very chaos between two hostile worlds the upper court world the nether sansculottic one and beaten on by both toil painfully perilously doing in sad literal earnest the impossible End of section thirty nine Section forty of the French Revolution, Volume One by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Wayman. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Six, Chapter Five, The Fourth Estate pamphleteering opens its abysmal throat wider and wider never to close more our philosophes indeed rather withdraw after the manner of marmontel retiring in disgust the first day abbe reynal grown grey and quiet in his marseilles domicile is little content with this work the last literary act of the man will again be an act of rebellion an indignant letter to the constituent assembly answered by the order of the day thus also philosophe morellet puckers discontented brows being indeed threatened in his benefices by that fourth of august it is clearly going too far how astonishing that those haggard figures in woollen jupes would not rest as satisfied with speculation and victorious analysis as we alas yes speculation philosophism once the ornament and wealth of the saloon will now coin itself into mere practical propositions and circulate on street and highway universally with results 
a fourth estate of able editors springs up increases and multiplies irrepressible incalculable new printers new journals and ever new so prurient is the world let our three hundred curb and consolidate as they can lustalo under the wing of prudhomme dull blustering printer edits weekly his revolution de paris in an acrid emphatic manner acrid corrosive as the spirit of sloes and copperas is marat friend of the people struck already with the fact that the national assembly so full of aristocrats can do nothing except dissolve itself and make way for a better that the town hall representatives are little other than babblers and imbeciles if not even knaves poor is this man squalid and dwells in garrets a man unlovely to the sense inward and outward a man forbid and is becoming fanatical possessed with a fixed idea cruel losers of nature did nature o oh poor marat as in cruel sort knead thee out of her leavings and miscellaneous waste clay and fling thee forth stepdame like a distraction into this distracted eighteenth century work is appointed thee there which thou shalt do the three hundred have summoned and will again summon marat but always he croaks forth answer sufficient always he will defy them or elude them and endure no gag Cara, ex-secretary of a decapitated hospodar and then of a necklace cardinal likewise pamphleteer adventurer in many scenes and lands draws nigh to mercier of the tableau de paris and with foam on his lips proposes an anal patriotique the moniteur goes its prosperous way barrel weeps on paper as yet loyal rivarol royou are not idle deep calls to deep your domine salvum fac regem shall awaken pange lingua with an ami du peuple there is a king's friend newspaper ami du roi camille desmoulins has appointed himself procureur general de la lanterne attorney-general of the lamp iron and pleads not with atrocity under an atrocious title editing weekly his brilliant revolutions of paris and brabant brilliant we say for if in that thick murk of journalism with its dull blustering with its fixed or loose fury any ray of genius greet thee be sure it is camille's the thing that camille teaches he with his light finger adorns brightness plays gentle unexpected amid horrible confusions often is the word of camille worth reading when no others is questionable camille how thou glitterest with a fallen rebellious yet still semi-celestial light as is the starlight on the brow of lucifer son of the morning into what times and what lands art thou fallen but in all things is good though not good for consolidating revolutions thousand wagon-loads of this pamphleteering and newspaper matter lie rotting slowly in the public libraries of our europe snatched from the great gulf like oysters by bibliomaniac pearl-divers there must they first rot then what was pearl in camille or others may be seen as such and continue as such nor has public speaking declined though lafayette and his patrols look sour on it loud always is the palais royal loudest the café de foie such a miscellany of citizens and citizenesses circulating there now and then according to camille some citizens employ the liberty of the press for a private purpose so that this or the other patriot finds himself short of his watch or pocket-handkerchief but for the rest in camille's opinion nothing can be a livelier image of the roman forum a patriot proposes his motion if it finds any supporters they make him mount on a chair and speak 
if he is applauded he prospers and redacts if he is hissed he goes his ways thus they circulating and perorating tall shaggy marquis saint Irige, a man that has had losses and has deserved them is seen eminent and also heard bellowing is the character of his voice like that of a bull of bashan voice which drowns all voices which causes frequently the hearts of men to leap cracked or half cracked is this tall marquis's head uncracked are his lungs the cracked and the uncracked shall alike avail him consider further that each of the forty-eight districts has its own committee speaking and motioning continually aiding in the search for grain in the search for a constitution checking and spurring the poor three hundred of the town hall that danton with a voice reverberating from the domes is president of the cordelier district which has already become a goshen of patriotism that apart from the seventeen thousand utterly necessitous digging on montmartre most of whom indeed have got passes and been dismissed into space with four shillings there is a strike or a union of domestics out of place who assemble for public speaking next a strike of tailors for even they will strike and speak further a strike of journeymen cordwainers a strike of apothecaries so dear is bread all these having struck must speak generally under the open canopy and pass resolutions lafayette and his patrols watching them suspiciously from the distance unhappy mortals such tugging and lugging and throttling of one another to divide in some not intolerable way the joint felicity of man in this earth when the whole lot to be divided is such a feast of shells diligent are the three hundred none equal scipio americanus in dealing with mobs but surely all these things bode ill for the consolidating of a revolution end of section forty section forty one of the french revolution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by elizabeth buchanan the french revolution by thomas carlyle volume one book seven chapter one patrolitism no friends this revolution is not of the consolidating kind do not fires fevers sown seeds chemical mixtures men events all embodiments of force that work in this miraculous complex of forces named universe go on growing through their natural phases and developments each according to its kind reach their height reach their visible decline finally sink under vanishing and what we call die they all grow there is nothing but what grows and shoots forth into its special expansion once give it leave to spring observe too that each grows with a rapidity proportioned in general to the madness and unhealthiness there is in it slow regular growth though this also ends in death is what we name health and sanity a sans culottism which has prostrated bastilles which has got pike and musket and now goes burning chateaus passing resolutions and haranguing under roof and sky may be said to have sprung and by law of nature must grow to judge by the madness and diseasedness both of itself and of the soil and element it is in one might expect the rapidity and monstrosity would be extreme many things too especially all diseased things grow by shoots and fits the first grand fit and shooting forth of sans-culottism with that of paris conquering its king for bailey's figure of rhetoric was all too sad a reality the king is conquered going at large in his parole on conditions say of absolutely good behaviour which 
in these circumstances will unhappily mean no behaviour whatever a quite untenable position that of majesty put on its good behaviour alas is it not natural that whatever lives try to keep itself living whereupon his majesty's behaviour will soon become exceptionable and so the second grand fit of sansculottism that of putting him in durance cannot be distant necker in the national assembly is making moan as usual about his deficit barriers and custom-houses burnt the tax-gatherer hunted not hunting his majesty's exchequer all but empty the remedy is a loan of thirty millions then on still more enticing terms a loan of eighty millions neither of which loans unhappily will the stock jobbers venture to lend the stock jobber has no country except his own black pool of agio and yet in those days for men that have a country what a glow of patriotism burns in many a heart penetrating inwards to the very purse so early as the seventh of august a don patriotique a patriotic gift of jewels to a considerable extent has been solemnly made by certain parisian women and solemnly accepted with honourable mention whom forthwith all the world takes to imitating and emulating patriotic gifts always with some heroic eloquence which the president must answer and the assembly listen to flow in from far and near in such number that the honourable mention can only be performed in lists published at stated epochs each gives what he can the very cordwainers have behaved magnificently one landed proprietor gives a forest fashionable society gives its shoe buckles takes cheerfully to shoe ties unfortunate females give what they have amassed in loving the smell of all cash as vespasian thought is good beautiful and yet inadequate the clergy must be invited to melt the superfluous church plate in the royal mint nay finally a patriotic contribution of the forcible sort must be determined on though unwillingly let the fourth part of your declared yearly revenue for this once only be paid down so shall a national assembly make the constitution undistracted at least by insolvency their own wages as settled on the seventeenth of august are but eighteen francs a day each man but the public service must have sinews must have money to appease the deficit not to combler or choke the deficit if you or mortal could for withal as mirabeau was heard saying it is the deficit that saves us towards the end of august our national assembly in its constitutional labours has got so far as the question of veto shall majesty have a veto on the national enactments or not have a veto what speeches were spoken within doors and without clear and also passionate logic imprecations commendations gone happily for the most part to limbo through the cracked brain and uncracked lungs of saint Horinche, the palais royal rebellows with veto journalism is busy france rings with veto i shall never forget says dumont my going to paris one of these days with mirabeau and the crowd of people we found waiting for his carriage about leger the bookseller's shop they flung themselves before him conjuring him with tears in their eyes not to suffer the veto absolu they were in a frenzy monsieur le comte you are the people's father you must save us you must defend us against those villains who are bringing back despotism if the king gets this veto what is the use of the national assembly we are slaves all is done friends if the sky fall there will be catching of larks mirabeau adds dumont was imminent on such occasions he answered vaguely with a patrician imperturbability and bound himself to nothing deputations go to the hotel de ville anonymous letters to aristocrats in the national assembly threatening that fifteen thousand or sometimes that sixty thousand will march to illuminate you the paris districts are astir petitions signing saint Hurange sets forth from the palais royal with an escort of fifteen hundred individuals to petition in person resolute or seemingly so is the tall shaggy marquis is the cafe de foy but resolute also is commandant general lafayette the streets are all beset by patrols saint Hurange is stopped at the barriere des bon homes he may bellow like the bulls of bashan but absolutely must return 
the brethren of the palais royal circulate all night and make motions under the open canopy all coffee-houses being shut nevertheless lafayette and the town hall do prevail saint Hironge is thrown into prison veto absolu adjusts itself into suspensive veto prohibition not forever but for a term of time and this doom's clamour will grow silent as the others have done so far has consolidation prospered though with difficulty repressing the nether sansculotic world and the constitution shall be made with difficulty amid jubilee and scarcity patriotic gifts baker's cues abbe fauché harangues and with their are men of platoon musketry scipio americanus has deserved thanks from the national assembly in france they offer him stipends and emoluments to a handsome extent all which stipends and emoluments he covetous of far other blessedness than mere money does in his chivalrous way without scruple refuse to the parisian common man meanwhile one thing remains inconceivable that now when the bastille is down and french liberty restored grain should continue so dear our rights of man are voted feudalism and all tyranny abolished yet behold we stand in queue is it aristocrat forestallers a court still bent on intrigues something is rotten somewhere and yet alas what to do lafayette with his patrols prohibits everything even complaint saint Rouge and the other heroes of the veto lie in durance people's friend marat was seized printers of patriotic journals are fettered and forbidden the very hawkers cannot cry till they get a license till they get license and leaden badges blue national guards ruthlessly dissipate all groups scour with levelled bayonets the palais royal itself pass on your affairs along the rue Turin. the patrol presenting his bayonet cries to the left turn to the rue saint benoît he cries to the right a judicious patriot like camille desmoulins in this instance is driven for quietness sake to take the gutter o oh, much suffering people our glorious revolution is evaporating in tricolor ceremonies and complimentary harangues of which latter as lustelat accurately calculates upwards of two thousand have been delivered within the last month at the town hall alone and our mouths unfilled with bread are to be shut under penalties the caricaturist promulgates his emblematic tablature le patriotisme chasant la patriotisme patriotism driven out by patriotism ruthless patrols long superfine harangues and scanty ill-baked loaves more like baked bath bricks which produce an effect on the intestines where will this end in consolidation end of section forty one Section 42 of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Buchanan. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 7, Chapter 2. O Richard, O my King. For alas, neither is the town hall itself without misgivings the nether sans culotic world has been suppressed hitherto but then the upper court world symptoms there are that the oil de bouf is rallying more than once in the town hall sanhedrim often enough from those outspoken baker's cues has the wish uttered itself oh that our restorer of french liberty were here that he could see with his own eyes not with the false eyes of queens and cabals and his really good heart be enlightened for falsehood still environs him intriguing dux de guiche with bodyguards scouts of buil a new flight of intriguers now that the old has flown what else means this advent of the regiment de flandre entering versailles as we hear on the twenty third of september with two pieces of cannon did not the versailles national guard do duty at the chateau had they not swiss hundred swiss gods de corps bodyguards so called nay it would seem the number of bodyguards on duty has by a manoeuvre been doubled 
the new relieving battalion of them arrived at its time but the old relieved one does not depart actually there runs a whisper through the best informed upper circles or a nod still more portentous than whispering of his majesty's flying to metz of a bond to stand by him therein which has been signed by noblesse and clergy to the incredible amount of thirty or even of sixty thousand lafayette coldly whispers it and coldly acerbates it to count d'estang at the dinner-table and d'estang one of the bravest men quakes to the core lest some lackey overhear it and tumbles thoughtful without sleep all night regiment flandre as we have said is clearly arrived his majesty they say hesitates about sanctioning the fourth of august makes observations of chilling tenor on the very rights of man likewise may not all persons the bakers cues themselves discern on the streets of paris the most astonishing number of officers on furlough crosses of st louis and such like some reckon from a thousand to twelve hundred officers of all uniforms nay one uniform never before seen by eye green faced with red the tricolor cockade is not always visible but what in the name of heaven may these black cockades which somewhere foreshadow hunger wets everything especially suspicion and indignation realities themselves in this paris have grown unreal preternatural phantasms once more stalk through the brain of hungry france o oh, ye laggards and dastards cry shrill voices from the queues if ye had the hearts of men ye would take your pikes and second-hand firelocks and look into it not leave your wives and daughters to be starved murdered and worse peace women the heart of man is bitter and heavy patriotism driven out by patriotism knows not what to resolve on the truth is the will de bouffe has rallied to a certain unknown extent a changed will de bouffe with versailles national guards in their tricolour cockades doing duty there a court all flaring with tricolour yet even to a tricolour court men will rally ye loyal hearts burnt out seigneurs rally round your queen with wishes which will produce hopes which will produce attempts for indeed self-preservation being such a law of nature what can a rallied court do but attempt and endeavour or call it plot with such wisdom and unwisdom as it has they will fly escorted to metz where brave boule commands they will raise the royal standard the bond signatures shall become armed men were not the king so languid <sighs> their bond if at all signed must be signed without his privity unhappy king he has but one resolution not to have a civil war for the rest he still hunts having ceased lock-making he still dozes and digests is clay in the hands of the potter ill will it fare with him in a world where all is helping itself where as has been written whosoever is not hammer must be stithy and the very hyssop on the wall grows there in that chink because the whole universe could not prevent its growing but as for the coming up of this regiment de flandre may it not be urged that there were saint harange petitions and continual meal mobs undebouched soldiers be their plot or only dim elements of a plot are always good did not the versailles municipality an old monarchic one not yet refounded into a democratic instantly second the proposal nay the very versailles national guard wearied with continual duty at the chateau did not object only draper le contre who is now major le contre shook his head yes friends surely it was natural this regiment de flandre should be sent for since it could be got it was natural that at sight of military bandoliers the heart of the rallied will de bouffe should revive and maids of honour and gentlemen of honour speak comfortable words to epauletted defenders and to one another natural also and mere common civility that the bodyguards a regiment of gentlemen should invite their flandre brethren to a dinner of welcome such invitation in the last days of september is given and accepted dinners are defined as the ultimate act of communion 
men that can have communion in nothing else can sympathetically eat together can still rise into some glow of brotherhood over food and wine the dinner is fixed on for thursday the first of october and ought to have a fine effect further as such dinner may be rather extensive and even the non-commissioned and the common man be introduced to see and to hear could not his majesty's opera apartment which has lain quite silent ever since kaiser joseph was here be obtained for the purpose the whole of the opera is granted the salon de hercule shall be drawing-room not only the officers of flandre but of the swiss of the hundred swiss nay of the versailles national guard such of them as have any loyalty shall feast it will be a repast like few and now suppose this repast the solid part of it transacted and the first bottle over suppose the customary loyal toasts drunk the king's health the queen's with deafening the rats that of the nation omitted or even rejected suppose champagne flowing with pot valorous speech with instrumental music empty feathered heads growing ever the noisier in their own emptiness in each other's noise her majesty who looks unusually sad to-night his majesty sitting dulled with the day's hunting is told that the sight of it would cheer her behold she enters there issuing from her state-rooms like the moon from the clouds this fairest unhappy queen of hearts royal husband by her side young dauphine in her arms she descends from the boxes amid splendour and acclaim walks queen-like round the tables gracefully escorted gracefully nodding her looks full of sorrow yet of gratitude and daring with the hope of france on her mother bosom and now the band striking up o oh, richard o oh, monroy l'univers te abandon o oh, richard o oh, my king and world is all forsaking thee could man do other than rise to the height of pity of loyal valour could feather-headed young ensigns do other than by white bourbon cockades handed them from fair fingers by waving of swords drawn to pledge the queen's health by trampling of national cockades by scaling the boxes whence intrusive murmurs may come by vociferation tripudation sound fury and distraction within doors and without testify what tempest-tossed state of vacuity they are in till champagne and tripudation do their work and all lie silent horizontal passively slumbering with need of battle dreams a natural repast in ordinary times a harmless one now fatal as that of thyestes as that of job's sons when a strong wind smote the four quarters of their banquet house poor ill-advised marie antoinette with a woman's vehemence not with a sovereign's foresight it was so natural yet so unwise next day in public speech of ceremony her majesty declares herself delighted with the thursday the heart of the wildy beef glows into hope into daring which is premature rallied maids of honour waited on by abbeys so white cockades distribute them with words with glances to epauletted youths who in return may kiss not without fervour the fair sewing fingers captains of horse and foot go swashing with enormous white cockades nay one versailles national captain has mounted the like so witching were the words and glances and laid aside his tricolour well may major le contre shake his head with a look of severity and speak audible resentful words but now a swashbuckler with enormous white cockade overhearing the major invites him instantly once and then again elsewhere to recant and failing that to duel which latter feat major le contre declares that he will not perform not at least by any known laws of fence that he nevertheless will according to mere law of nature by dirk and blade exterminate any vile gladiator who may insult him or the nation whereupon 
for the major is actually drawing his implement. They are parted, and no weasons slit. End of section 42《Section 43 of The French Revolution》by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eden Ray Hedrick. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 7, Chapter 3 Black Cockades. But fancy what effect this Thiestes repast and trampling on the national cockade must have had in the salle de menu, in the famishing baker's queues at Paris. Nay, such the estes repasts, as it would seem, continue. Flandre has given its counter-dinner to the Swiss and hundred Swiss, then on Saturday there has been another. Yes, here with us is famine, but yonder at Versailles is food, enough and to spare. Patriotism stands in the queue, shivering hunger-struck, insulted by patriotism, while bloody-minded aristocrats, heated with excess of high living, trample on the national cockade. Can the atrocity be true? Nay, look, green uniforms faced with red, black cockades, the color of night. Are we to have military onfall, and death also by starvation? For behold the Corbeil corn-boat, which used to come twice a day, with its plaster of Paris meal, now comes only once. And the town hall is deaf, and the men are laggard and dastard. At the Café du Foy this Saturday evening, a new thing is seen, not the last of its kind, a woman engaged in public speaking. Her poor man, she says, was put to silence by his district. Their presidents and officials would not let him speak. Wherefore she here, with her shrill tongue, will speak, denouncing while her breath endures the corbeil boat, the plaster of Paris bread, sacrilegious opera dinners, green uniforms, pirate aristocrats, and those black cockades of theirs. Truly it is time for the black cockades, at least, to vanish. Them patriotism itself will not protect. Nay, sharp-tempered Monsieur Tassin, at the Tuileries parade on Sunday morning, forgets all national military rule, starts from the ranks, wrenches down one black cockade which is swashing ominous there, and tramples it fiercely into the soil of France. Patriotism itself is not without suppressed fury. Also the districts begin to stir. The voice of President Danton reverberates in the Cordelier. People's friend Marais has flown to Versailles and back again. Swart bird, not of the halcyon kind. And so Patriot meets Promenading Patriot this Sunday, and sees his own grim care reflected on the face of another. Groups, in spite of patriotism, which is not so alert as usual, fluctuate deliberative. Groups on the bridges, on the quays, at the patriotic cafés. And ever as any black cockade may emerge, rises the many-voiced growl and bark, Abba! Down! All black cockades are ruthlessly plucked off. One individual picks his up again, kisses it, attempts to refix it, but a hundred canes start in the air, and he desists. Still worse went it with another individual, doomed, by extempore plebiscitum, to the lantern, saved, with difficulty, by some active corps de gare. Lafayette sees signs of an effervescence, which he doubles his patrols, doubles his diligence, to prevent. So passes Sunday, the 4th of October, 1789. Sullen as the male heart, repressed by patriotism, vehement as the female, irrepressible. The public speaking woman at the Palais Royal was not the only speaking one. Men know not what the pantry is when it grows empty. Only house mothers know. Oh, women, wives of men that will only calculate and not act. Patriotism is strong, but death, by starvation and military onfall, is stronger. Patriotism represses male patriotism, but female patriotism? Will guards named national thrust their bayonets into the bosoms of women? Such thought, or rather such dim, unshaped, raw material of a thought, ferments universally under the female nightcap, and, by earliest daybreak, on slight hint, will explode. End of section 43 of The French Revolution Section 44 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim McDougall. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 7, Chapter 4. The Menads. If Voltaire once, in a splenetic humor, asked his countrymen, But you Gulches, what have you invented? They can now answer, 
the art of insurrection. It was an art needed in these last singular times, an art for which the French nature, so full of vehemence, so free from depth, was perhaps of all others the fittest. Accordingly, to what a height, one may well say of perfection, has this branch of human industry been carried by France within the last half century. Insurrection, which Lafayette thought might be the most sacred of duties, ranks now for the French people among the duties which they can perform. Other mobs are dull masses, which roll onwards with a dull, fierce tenacity, a dull, fierce heat, but emit no light flashes of genius as they go. The French mob, again, is among the liveliest phenomena of our world. So rapid, audacious, so clear-sighted, inventive, prompt to seize the moment, instinct with life to its finger ends. That talent, were there no other, of spontaneously standing in queue, distinguishes, as we said, the French people from all peoples, ancient and modern. Let the reader confess, too, that taking one thing with another, perhaps few terrestrial appearances are better worth considering than mobs. Your mob is a genuine outburst of nature, issuing from or communicating with the deepest deep of nature. When so much goes grinning and grimacing as a lifeless formality, and under the stiff buckram no heart can be felt beating, here once more, if nowhere else, is the sincerity and reality. Shudder at it, or even shriek over it, if thou must. Nevertheless consider it. Such a complex of human forces and individualities hurled forth in their transcendental mood, to act and react, on circumstances and on one another, to work out what it is in them to work. The thing they will do is known to no man, least of all to themselves. It is the inflammablest and measurable firework, generating, consuming itself. With what phrases, to what extent, with what results it will burn off, philosophy and perspicacity conjecture in vain. Man, as has been written, is forever interesting to man. Nay, properly, there is nothing else interesting. In which light also may we not discern why most battles have become so wearisome? Battles in these ages are transacted by mechanism, with the slightest possible development of human individuality or spontaneity. Men now even die and kill one another in an artificial manner. Battles ever since Homer's time, when they were fighting mobs, have mostly ceased to be worth looking at, worth reading of, or remembering. How many wearisome, bloody battles does history strive to represent, or even, in a husky way, to sing, and she would omit or carelessly slur over this one insurrection of women? A thought, or dim, raw material of a thought, was fermenting all night, universally in the female head, and might explode. In squalid garret, on Monday morning, maternity awakes to hear children weeping for bread. Maternity must forth to the streets, to the herb markets and bakers. Cues, meets there with hunger-stricken maternity, sympathetic, exasperative. Oh, we unhappy women! But instead of bakers' cues, why not to aristocrats' palaces, the root of the matter? Alone, let us assemble, to the Hôtel de Ville, to Versailles, to the Lanterne. In one of the guard houses of the Cartier Saint Eustache, a young woman seizes a drum. For how shall national guards give fire on women, on a young woman? The young woman seizes the drum, sets forth, beating it, uttering cries relative to the dearth of grains. Descend, O mothers, descend ye Judiths, to food and revenge. All women gather and go, crowds storm all stairs. Force out all women. The female insurrectionary force, according to Camille, resembles the English naval one. There is a universal press of women. Robust dames of the hall, slim mantua makers, assiduous, risen with the dawn, ancient virginity tripping to matins, the housemaid with early broom, all must go. Rouse ye, O women. The laggard men will not act. They say, we ourselves may act. And so, like snowbreak from the mountains, for every staircase is a melted brook, its storms, tumultuous, wild shrilling, towards the Hotel de Ville, tumultuous, with or without drum music, for the Faubourg Saint-Antoine also has tucked up its gown, 
and with besom staves, fire irons, and even rusty pistols, void of ammunition, is flowing on. Sound of it flies, with a velocity of sound, to the outmost barriers. By seven o'clock on this raw October morning, fifth of the month, the town hall will see wonders. Nay, as chance would have it, a male party are already there, clustering tumultuously round some national patrol, and a baker who has been seized with short weights. They are there, and have even lowered the rope of the lantern, so that the official persons have to smuggle forth the short weighing baker by back doors, and even send to all the districts for more force. Grand it was, says Camille, to see so many Judiths, from eight to ten thousand of them in all, rushing out to search into the root of the matter. Not unfrightful it must have been, ludicro terrific and most unmanageable. At such hour the overwatched three hundred are not yet stirring, none but some clerks, a company of national guards, and Monsieur de Gouvion, the major general. Gouvion has fought in America for the cause of civil liberty, a man of no inconsiderable heart, but deficient in head. He is for the moment in his back apartment, assuaging Usher Maillard, the Bastille sergeant, who has come, as too many do, with representations. The assuagement is still incomplete when our Judiths arrive. The National Guards form on the outer stairs, with leveled bayonets. The ten thousand Judiths press up, resistless, with obtestations, with outspread hands, merely to speak to the mayor. The rear forces them, Nay, from male hands in the rear, stones already fly. The National Guards must do one of two things, sweep the Place de Greve with cannon, or else to open right and left. They open, the living deluge rushes in, through all rooms and cabinets, upwards to the topmost belfry, ravenous, seeking arms, seeking mares, seeking justice, while again the better dressed speak kindly to the clerks, point out the misery of these poor women, also their ailments, some even of an interesting sort. Poor Monsieur de Gouvion is shiftless in this extremity, a man shiftless, perturbed, who will one day commit suicide. How happy for him that Usher Mayar, the shifty, was there at the moment, though making representations. Fly back, thou shifty Mayar, seek the Bastille company, and O return fast with it, above all with thy own shifty head. For behold, the Judiths can find no mayor or municipal. Scarcely in the topmost belfry can they find poor Abbé Lefebvre, the powder distributor. Him, for want of a better, they suspend there, in the pale morning light, over the top of all Paris, which swims in one's failing eyes. A horrible end? Nay, the rope broke, as French ropes often did, or else an Amazon cut it. Abbé Lefebvre falls some twenty feet, rattling among the leads, and lives long years after, though always with a tremblement in the limbs. And now doors fly under hatchets, the Judiths have broken the armory, have seized guns and cannons, three money bags, paper heaps, torches flare. In few minutes, our brave Hotel de Ville, which dates from the fourth Henry, will, with all that it holds, be in flames. End of section 44。section 45 of the French Revolution。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer、please visit LibriVox.org。recording by Jeff Allen。the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle。volume one。Book Seven, Chapter Five, Usher Maillard. In flames, truly, were it not that Usher Maillard, swift of foot, shifty of head, has returned. Maillard, of his own motion, for Gouvon or the rest would not even sanction him, snatches a drum, descends the porch stairs, rantan, beating sharp with loud rolls. His rogues march to Versailles, Ayon, a Versailles as men beat on kettle or warming pin, when angry she-bees, or say, flying desperate wasps, are to be hive, and the desperate insects hear it, and cluster round it, simply as round a guidance, where there was none. 
So now these menads, round shifty Maillard, riding you share of the Châtelet. The axe pauses uplifted. Abe Lefrave is left half-hanged. From the belfry downwards, all vomits itself. What rub dub is that? Stanislaw Maillard, Bastille hero, will lead us to Versailles? Joy to thee, Maillard. Blessed art thou above riding Ushers. Away then, away! The seized cannon are yoked with seized cart horse. Brown locked Demoiselle Theroin, with pike and helmet, sits there as gunneress, with haughty eye and serene fair countenance, comparable, some think, to the maid of Orleans, or even recalling the idea of Pallas Athene. Maillard, for his drum still rolls, is by heaven-rending acclamation, admitted general. Maillard hastens the languid march. Maillard, beating rhythmic with sharp rantan, all along the quays, leads forward with difficulty his monadic host. Such a host, marched not in silence. The bargeman pauses on the river. All wagoners and coach-drivers fly. Men peer from windows, not women, lest they be pressed sight of sights. Bacantes, in these ultimate formalized ages, Franz Henri looks on, from his Pont Nou, the monarchic Louvre. Medici and Tuileries see a day not theretofore seen, and now Maillard has his menads in the Champs Elysees, fields Tartarian, rather, and the Hôtel de Ville has suffered comparatively nothing. Broken doors, and Abe Lefavre, who shall never more distribute powder. Three sacks of money, most part of which, for sanculatism, though famishing, is not without honor, shall be returned. This is all the damage, great Maillard. A small nucleus of order is round his drum, but his outskirts fluctuate like the mad ocean. For rascality, male and female, is flowing in on him from the four winds, Guidance there is none, but in his single head and two drumsticks. O oh, my yard, when since war first was, had general of force such a task before him as thou this day? Walter the penniless still touches the feeling heart, but then Walter had sanction, had space to turn in, and also his crusaders were of the male sex. Thou this day, disowned of heaven and earth, art general of Menads, their inarticulate frenzy, thou must on the spur of the instant render into articulate words, into action that are not frantic. Fail in it, this way or that. Pragmatical officiality, with its penalties and law books, waits for thee. Menads storm behind. If such hewed off the melodious head of Orpheus and hurled it into the penuous waters, what may they not make of thee? The rhythmic merely. With no music but a sheepskin drum, my yard did not fail. Remarkable, my yard, if fame were not an accident, and history a distillation of rumor, how remarkable wert thou. On the Elysian fields there is pause and fluctuation, but, for my yard, no return. He persuades his menads, clamorous for arms and the arsenal, that no arms are in the arsenal, that an unarmed attitude and petition to a national assembly will be the best. He hastily nominates or sanctions General Lassi, captains of tens and fifties, and so, in loosest flowing order, to the rhythm of some eight drums, having laid aside his own, with the Bastille volunteers bringing up his rear, once more takes the road. Chelo, which will promptly yield baked loaves, is not plundered, nor are the Sev potteries broken. The old arches of Sev's bridge echo under monadic feet. Sen River gushes on with his perpetual murmur, and Paris flings after us the boom of toxin and alarm drum, inaudible for the present, amid shrill-sounding hosts and the splash of rainy weather. To Meudon, to St. Cloud, on both hands, the report of them is gone abroad, and hearths this evening will have a topic. The press of women still continues, for it is the cause of all Eve's daughters, mothers that are, or that hope to be. 
No carriage lady were it with never such hysterics, but must dismount in the mud roads in her silk shoes and walk. In this manner, amid wild October weather, they a wild and unwinged stork flight, through the astonished country, wend their way. Travellers of all sort they stop, especially travellers or couriers from Paris. Deputy Le Chapelier, in his elegant vesture, from his elegant vehicle, looks forth amazed through his spectacles, apprehensive for life, states eagerly that he is a patriot. Deputy Le Chapelier, and even old President Le Capelier, who presided on the night of Pentecost, and is original member of the Brenton Club. Thereupon rises huge shout, Vive les Chapeliers! And several armed persons spring up behind and before to escort him. Nevertheless, news, dispatches from Lafayette, or vague noise of rumor, have pierced through by side roads. In the National Assembly, while all is busy discussing the order of the day, regretting that there should be anti-national repasts in opera halls, and His Majesty should still hesitate about accepting the rights of man, and hang conditions and peradventures on them. Mirabeau steps up to the President, experienced Monier as it chanced to be, and articulates, in base undertone, quote, Monier, Paris marche sur nous. Paris is marching on us, unquote. Quote, maybe, je ne sais rien, unquote. Quote, believe it or disbelieve it, that is not my concern. But Paris, I say, is marching on us. Fall suddenly unwell, go over to the chateau, tell them this, there is not a moment to lose, unquote. Quote, Paris, marching on us, responds Monnier, with an ultra biliar accent. Well, so much the better. We shall the sooner be a republic, unquote. Mirabeau quits him, as one quits an experienced president getting blindfold into deep waters, and the order of the day continues as before. Yes, Paris is marching on us, and more than the women of Paris. Scarcely was Maillard gone, when Major de Gouvon's message to all the districts, and such toxin and drumming of the general began to take effect. Armed National Guards from every district, especially the Grenadiers of the center, who are our old guards Francais, arrive in quick sequence on the Palais de Grieve. An immense people is there. Saint Antoine, with pike and rusty firelock, is all crowding thither, be it welcome or unwelcome. The center Grenadiers are received with cheering. Quote, it is not cheers that we want, answer they gloomily. The nation has been insulted to arms and come with us for orders, unquote. Ha, sits the wind so. Patriotism and patrolitism are now one. The three hundred have assembled. All the committees are in activity. Lafayette is dictating dispatches for Versailles when a deputation of the center grenadiers introduces itself to him. The deputation makes military obeisance and thus speaks, not without a kind of thought in it. Quote, Mon General, we are deputed by the six companies of grenadiers. We do not think you a traitor, but we think the government betrays you. It is time that this end. We cannot turn our bayonets against women crying to us for bread. The people are miserable. The source of the mischief is at Versailles. We must go seek the king and bring him to Paris. We must exterminate, exterminate, the regiment de Flandre and the guards de Cour, who have dared to trample on the national cockade. If the king be too weak to wear his crown, let him lay it down. You will crown his son. You will name a council of regency, and all will go better. Unquote. Reproachful astonishment paints itself on the face of Lafayette speaks itself from his eloquent chivalrous lips. In vain. Quote, My general, we would shed the last drop of our blood for you, but the root of the mischief is at Versailles. We must go and bring the king to Paris. All the people wish it. Tous les peuples me voient. 
my general descends to the outer staircase and harangues once more in vain. Quote, to Versailles! To Versailles! Unquote. Mayor Bailey, sent for through floods of sanculotism, attempts academic oratory from his gilt stagecoach, realizes nothing but infinite hoarse cries of quote, Bread! To Versailles! Unquote, and gladly shrinks within doors. Lafayette mounts the white charger and again harangues and re harangues with eloquence, with firmness indignant demonstrations with all things but persuasion quote, to versailles to versailles unquote. so lasts it hour after hour for the space of half a day the great scipio americanus can do nothing not so much as escape quote, more blue mon general unquote, cry the grenadiers zerying their ranks as the white charger makes a motion that way. Quote, you will not leave us. You will abide with us. Unquote. A perilous juncture. Mayor Bailey and the municipals sit quaking within doors. My general is prisoner without. The play de Grieve, with its 30,000 regulars, its whole irregular Saint Antoine and Saint Marcel, is one miniatory mass of clear or rusty steel all hearts set with a moody fixedness on one object. Moody, fixed are all hearts. Tranquil is no heart, if it be not that of the white charger, who paused there with arched neck, composedly champing his bit, as if no world, with its dynasties and eras, were now rushing down. The drizzly day tends westward. The cry is still, quote, To Versailles! Unquote. Nay, now, born from afar, come quit sinister cries. Hoarse, reverberating in long-drawn hollow murmurs, with syllables too like that of La Terne. Or else, irregular sanculatism may be marching off, of itself, with pikes, nay, with cannon. The inflexible Scipio does at length, by aide de camp, Ask of the municipals whether or not he may go. A letter is handed out to him. Over armed heads, 60,000 faces flash fixedly on his. There is stillness, and no bosom breathes till he have read. By heaven he grows suddenly pale. Do the municipals permit? Permit, and even order? Since he can no other. Clangor of approval rends the welkin. To your ranks, then, let us march. It is, as we compute, towards three in the afternoon. Indignant National Guards may dine once more from their haversack. Dined or undined, they march with one heart. Paris flings up her windows, claps hands, as the Avengers, with their shrilling drums and shalms, tramp by. She will then sit pensive, apprehensive, and pass rather a sleepless night. On the white charger Lafayette, in the slowest possible manner, going and coming and eloquently haranguing among the ranks, rolls onward with his thirty thousand. San Antoine, with pike and cannon, has preceded him. A mixed multitude of all and of no arms hovers on his flank and skirts. The country once more pauses agape. Paris Marche sur nous. End of section 45. Section 46 of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 7, Chapter 6. To Versailles. For indeed, about this same moment, Maya has halted his draggled menads on the last hilltop, and now Versailles, and the Chateau of Versailles, and far and wide the inheritance of royalty opens to the wandering eye. From far on the right, over Marly and saint germain en laye round towards Rambouillet on the left, beautiful all, 
softly unbosomed, as if in sadness in the dim moist weather. And near before us is Versailles, new and old, with that broad frondent avenue de Versailles between. Stately frondent, broad, three hundred feet as men reckon, with four rows of elms, and then the Chateau de Versailles, ending in royal parks and pleasances, gleaming lakelets, arbors, labyrinths, the menagerie, and great and little Trianon, high-towered dwellings, leafy pleasant places, where the gods of this lower world abide, whence, nevertheless, black care cannot be excluded, whether menadic hunger is even now advancing, armed with pike fursy. Yes, yonder, mesdames, where our straight frondent avenue, joined, as you note, by two frondent brother avenues from this hand and from that, spreads out into Place Royale and Palais Four Court. Yonder is the Salle des Menus. Yonder an august assembly sits regenerating France. Four Court, Grand Court, Court of Marble, Court narrowing into Court, you may discern next or fancy on the extreme verge of which that glass dome, visibly glittering like a star of hope, is the œil de boeuf. Yonder or nowhere in the world is bread baked for us. But, ô oh, mesdames, were not one thing good, that our cannons, with Demoiselle Terroigne, and all show of war, be put to the rear? Submission beseems petitioners of a national assembly. We are strangers in Versailles. Whence, to audibly, there comes even now sound as of toxing and general, also to put on, if possible, a cheerful countenance, hiding our sorrows, and even to sing, sorrow, pitied of the heavens, is hateful, suspicious to the earth. So counsels Shifty Maya, haranguing his minads on the heights near Versailles. Can in Maillard's dispositions are obeyed, the draggled insurrectionists advance up the avenue in three columns, among the four elm rows, singing Henri IV with what melody they can, and shouting Vive le roi! Versailles, though the elm rows are dripping wet, crowds from both sides with Vive nos Parisiennes, our Paris ones forever! Breakers, scouts have been out towards Paris, as the rumour deepened whereby his majesty, gone to shoot in the woods of Meudon, has been happily discovered and got home, and the general and toxin set a sounding. The bodyguards are already drawn up in front of the palais grates, and look down the avenue de Versailles, sulky in wet buckskins. Flandre too is there, repentant of the opera repast. Also dragons dismounted are there, Finally, Major Le Cointre and what he can gather of the Versailles National Guard. Though, is to be observed, our colonel, that same sleepless Count d'Estaing, giving neither order nor ammunition, has vanished most improperly, one supposes, into the Oeil de Boeuf. Red coat is Swiss stand within the grades, under arms. There, likewise, in their inner room, all the ministers, saint priest, Lamentation Pompignon and the rest are assembled with Monsieur Necker. They sit with him there, blank, expecting what the hour will bring. President Meunier, though he answered Mirabeau with a tant mieux and affected to slight the matter, had his own forebodings. Surely, for these four weary hours, he has reclined not on roses. The order of the day is getting forward. A deputation to His Majesty seems proper, that it might please him to grant acceptance pure and simple to those constitution articles of ours. The mixed qualified acceptance, with its peradventures, is satisfactory to neither gods nor men. So much is clear, and yet there is more, which no man speaks, which all men now vaguely understand. Disquietude? Absence of mind is on every face. Members whisper, uneasily come and go. The order of the day is evidently not the day's want. Till at length, from the outer gates, is heard a rustling and jostling, shrill uproar and squabbling, muffled by walls, which testifies that the hour is come. Rushing and crushing one hears now, 
then enter Ashamaya with a deputation of fifteen muddy dripping women, having by incredible industry and aid of all the macers persuaded the rest to wait out of doors. National Assembly shall now, therefore, look its august task directly in the face. Regenerative constitutionalism has an unregenerate sanculotism bodily in front of it, crying, Bread, bread! Shifty Meyer, translating frenzy into articulation, repressive with the one hand, expotulative with the other, does his best. And really, though not bred to public speaking, manages rather well. In the present dreadful rarity of grains, a deputation of female citizens has, as the August Assembly can discern, come out from Paris to petition. Plots of aristocrats are too evident in the matter. For example, one miller has been bribed by a banknote of two hundred livres, not to grind. Name unknown to the usher, but fact provable, at least indubitable. Further, it seems, the national cockade has been trampled on. Also, there are black cockades, oh where? All which things will not an august national assembly, the hope of France, take into its wise immediate consideration? And Minadic hunger, impressible, crying, black cockades, crying, bread, bread, adds after such fashion, will it not? Yes, monsieur, if a deputation to his majesty, for the acceptance pure and simple seemed proper, how much more now for the afflicting situation of Paris, for the calming of this effervescence? President Meunier, with a speedy deputation, among whom we notice the respectable figure of Dr. Guillotin, gets himself forthwith on march. Vice President shall continue the order of the day. Usher Meyer shall stay by him to repress the women. It is four o'clock of the miserable afternoon when Meunier steps out. Oh, experienced Meunier, what an afternoon! The last of thy political existence! Better had it been to fall suddenly unwell while it was yet time. For, behold, the esplanade, over all its spacious expanse, is covered with groups of squalid dripping women, of lank-haired male rascality, armed with axes, rusty pikes, old muskets, iron-shot clubs, batons ferrés, which end in knives or sword blades, a kind of extempore billhook, looking nothing but hungry revolt. The rain pours. Garde du corps go caracoling through the groups amid hisses, irritating and agitating what is but dispersed here to reunite there. Innumerable squalid women beleaguer the president and deputation, insist on going with him, as not his majesty himself, looking from the window, sent out to ask, What we wanted? Bread and speech with the king. Du pain et parler au roi. That was the answer. Twelve women are clamorously added to the deputation and march with it across the esplanade through dissipated groups, caracoling bodyguards and the pouring rain. President Meunier, unexpectedly augmented by twelve women, copiously escorted by hunger and rascality, is himself mistaken for a group. Himself and his women are dispersed by caracolers, rally again with difficulty among the mud. Finally, the grades are opened. The deputation gets access, with the twelve women too in it, of which latter five shall even see the face of his majesty. Let wet minadism in the best spirits it can expect their return. End of section 46「is busy with Flandre and the dismounted dragoons. She, and such women as are fittest, go through the ranks, 
speak with an earnest jocosity clasp rough troopers to their patriot bosom crush down spontoons and musketoons with soft arms can a man that were worthy of the name of man attack famishing patriot women one reads that Teroyne had bags of money which she distributed over flandre furnished by whom alas with money-bags one seldom sits on insurrectionary cannon calumnious royalism Teroyne had only the limited earnings of her profession of unfortunate female money she had not but brown locks the figure of a heathen goddess and an eloquent tongue and heart meanwhile saint antoine in groups and troops is continually arriving wedded sulky with pikes and impromptu bill-hooks driven thus far by popular fixed idea so many hirsute figures driven hither in that manner figures that have come to do they know not what figures that have come to see it done distinguished among all figures who is this of gaunt stature with leaden breastplate though a small one bushy and red grizzled locks nay with long tile beard it is jordan unjust dealer in mules a dealer no longer but a painter's lay figure playing truant this day from the necessity of art comes his long tile beard whence his leaden breastplate unless indeed he were some hawker licensed by leaden badge may have come will perhaps remain for ever a historical problem another saul among the people we discern pere adam father adam as the groups name him to us better known as bull-voiced marquis saint harouge hero of the veto a man that has had losses and deserved them the tall marquis emitted some days ago from limbo looks peripatetically on this scene from under his umbrella not without interest all which persons and things hurled together as we see palace athena busy with flandre patriotic versailles national guards short of ammunition and deserted by d'estaing their colonel and commanded by le contreur their major then caracoling bodyguards sour dispirited with their buckskins wet and finally this flowing sea of indignant squalor may they not give rise to occurrences behold however the twelve she-deputies return from the chateau without president monnier indeed but radiant with joy shouting life to the king and his house apparently the news are good miss dams news of the best five of us were admitted to the internal splendours to the royal presence this slim damsel louison chabray worker in sculpture aged only seventeen as being of the best looks and address her we appointed speaker on whom and indeed on all of us his majesty looked nothing but graciousness nay when louison addressing him was like to faint he took her in his royal arms and said gallantly it was well worth while elle en valut bien le pain consider o oh women what a king his words were of comfort and that only there shall be provision sent to paris if provision is in the world grain shall circulate free as air millers shall grind or do worse while their millstones endure and nothing be left wrong which a restorer of french liberty can write good news these but to wet menads all too incredible there seems no proof then words of comfort are words only which will feed nothing o oh, miserable people betrayed by aristocrats who corrupt thy very messengers in his royal arms mademoiselle louisanne in his arms thou shameless minx worthy of a name that shall be nameless yes thy skin is soft ours is rough with hardship and well wedded waiting here in the rain no children hast thou hungry at home only alabaster dolls that weep not the traitress to the lantern and so poor louison chabray no asservation or shrieks availing her fair slim damsel late in the arms of royalty has a garter round her neck and furibund amazons at each end is about to perish so when two bodyguards gallop up indignantly dissipating and rescue her the miscredited twelve hasten back to the chateau for an answer in writing nay behold a new flight of menads with im Brunon, bastille volunteer as impressed commandant at the head of it these also will advance to the great of the grand court and see what is toward human patience and wet buckskins has its limits bodyguard lieutenant m de savonniers for one moment lets his temper long provoked long pent give way he not only dissipates these latter menads but caracoles and cuts or indignantly flourishes at imbernon 
the impressed commandant and finding great relief in it even chases him bruneau flying nimbly though in a pirouette manner and now with sword also drawn at which sight of wrath and victory two other bodyguards for wrath is contagious and to pent bodyguards is so solacing do likewise give way give chase with brandished sabre and in the air make horrid circles so that poor Brunon has nothing for it but to retreat with accelerated nimbleness through rank after rank parthian-like fencing as he flies above all shouting lustily ennui la s'assassinier they are getting us assassinated shameful three against one growls come from the les contran ranks bellowings lastly shots savonnier's arm is raised to strike the bullet of a le contrin musket shatters it the brandished sabre jingles down harmless bruneau has escaped this duel well ended but the wild howl of war is everywhere beginning to pipe the amazons recoil saint antoine has cannon pointed full of grape-shot thrice applies the lit flambeau which thrice refuses to catch the touch-holes are so wetted and voices cry Eretez! il n'est pas tant encore stop it is not yet time messieurs of the garde de co ye had orders not to fire nevertheless two of you limp dismounted and one war-horse lies slain were it not well to draw back out of shot range finally to file off into the interior if in so filing off there did a musketoon or two discharge itself at these armed shopkeepers hooting and crowing could man wonder draggled are your white cockades of an enormous size would to heaven they were got exchanged for tricolor ones your buckskins are wet your hearts heavy go and return not the bodyguard file off as we hint giving and receiving shots drawing no life-blood leaving boundless indignation some three times in the thickening dusk a glimpse of them is seen at this or the other portal saluted always with execrations with the woo of lead let but a bodyguard shoe face he is hunted by rascality for instance poor m de mocheton of the scotch company owner of the slain war-horse and has to be smuggled off by the versailles captains or rusty firelocks belch after him shivering asunder his hat in the end by superior order the bodyguards all but the few on immediate duty disappear or as it were abscond and march under cloud of night to rambouillet weber ubi supra we remark also that the versailles have now got ammunition all afternoon the official person could find none till in these so critical moments a patriotic sub-lieutenant set a pistol to his ear and would thank him to find some which he thereupon succeeded in doing likewise that flandre disarmed by pallas athena says openly it will not fight with citizens and for token of peace has exchanged cartridges with the versailles sans culottism is now among mere friends and can circulate freely indignant at bodyguards complaining also considerably of hunger end of section forty seven section forty eight of the french revolution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Buchanan. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Seven, Chapter Eight, The Equal Diet. But why lingers Monnier? Returns not with his deputation. It is six. It is seven o'clock, and still no Monnier, no acceptance, pure and simple and behold the dripping monads not now in deputation but in mass have penetrated into the assembly to the shamefullest interruption of public speaking and order of the day neither maillard nor vice-president can restrain them except within wide limits not even except for minutes can the lion voice of mirabeau though they applaud it but ever and anon they break in upon the regeneration of france with cries of bread not so much discoursing du pain pastant de longs discours so insensible were these poor creatures to the bursts of parliamentary eloquence one learns also that the royal carriages are getting yoked as if for metz 
carriages royal or not have verily showed themselves at the back gates they even produced or quoted a written order from our versailles municipality which is a monarchic not a democratic one however versailles patrols drove them in again as the vigilant le contre had strictly charged them to do a busy man truly is major le contre in these hours for colonel d'estaing loiters invisible in the oil de bouffe invisible or still more questionably visible for instance then also a too loyal municipality requires supervision no order civil or military taken about any of these thousand things le contre is at the versailles town hall he is at the great of the grand court communing with swiss and bodyguards he is in the ranks of flandre he is here he is there studious to prevent bloodshed to prevent the royal family from flying to metz the menads from plundering versailles at the fall of night we behold him advance to those armed groups of saint antoine hovering all too grim near the salle des menus they receive him in a half circle twelve speakers behind cannons with lighted torches in hand the cannon mouths towards le contre a picture for salvator he asks in temperate but courageous language what they by this their journey to versailles do specially want the twelve speakers reply in few words inclusive of much bread and the end of these brabbles du pain et la fin des affaires when the affairs will end no major le contre nor no mortal can say but as to bread he inquires how many are you learns that they are six hundred that a loaf each will suffice and rides off to the municipality to get six hundred loaves which loaves however a municipality of monarchic temper will not give it will give two tons of rice rather could you but know whether it should be boiled or raw nay when this too is accepted the municipals have disappeared ducked under as the six-and-twenty long gowned of paris did and leaving not the smallest vestige of rice in the boiled or raw state they there vanish from history rice comes not one's hope of food is balked even one's hope of vengeance is not in de machoton of the scotch company as we said deceitfully smuggled off failing all which behold only in de machoton's slain war-horse lying on the esplanade there saint antoine balked esurient pounces on the slain war-horse flays it roasts it with such fuel of paling gates portable timber as can be come at not without shouting and after the matter of ancient greek heroes they lifted their hands to the daintily readied repast such as it might be other rascality prowls discursive seeking what it may devour flandre will retire to its barracks le contre also with his versailles all but the vigilant patrols charged to be doubly vigilant so sink the shadows of night blustering rainy and all paths grow dark strangest night ever seen in these regions perhaps since the bartholomew night when versailles as the bassompierre writes of it was a chetif chateau oh for the lyre of some orpheus to constrain with touch of melodious strings these mad masses into order for here all seems fallen asunder in wide yawning dislocation the highest as in dune rushing of a world is come in contact with the lowest the rascality of france beleaguering the royalty of france iron-shod batons lifted round the diadem not to guard it with denunciations of bloodthirsty anti-national bodyguards are heard dark growlings against a queenly name the court sits tremulous powerless varies with the varying temper of the esplanade with the varying colour of the rumours from paris thick coming rumours now of peace now of war necker and all the ministers consult with a blank issue the oil de bouffe is one tempest of whispers we will fly to metz we will not fly the royal carriages again attempt egress though for trial merely they are again driven in by le contre's patrols in six hours nothing has been resolved on not even the acceptance pure and simple in six hours alas he who in such circumstances cannot resolve in six minutes may give up the enterprise him fate has already resolved for and monadism meanwhile and sansculottism take counsel with the national assembly grows more and more tumultuous there mounier returns not authority nowhere shews itself 
the authority of france lies for the present with le contre and usher maillard this then is the abomination of desolation come suddenly though long foreshadowed as inevitable for to the blind all things are sudden misery which through long ages had no spokesman no helper will now be its own helper and speak for itself the dialect one of the rudest is what it could be this at eight o'clock there returns to our assembly not the deputation but dr guillotine announcing that it will return also that there is hope of the acceptance pure and simple he himself has brought a royal letter authorizing and commanding the freest circulation of grains which royal letter menadism with its whole heart applauds conformably to which the assembly forthwith passes a decree also received with the rapturous menadic plaudits only could not an august assembly contrive further to fix the price of bread at eight sous the half quartern butcher's meat at six sous the pound which seem fair rates such a motion do a multitude of men and women irrepressible by usher maillard now make now does an august assembly here made usher maillard himself is not always perfectly measured in speech but if rebuked he can justly excuse himself by the peculiarity of the circumstances but finally this decree well passed and the disorder continuing and members melting away and no president monnier returning what can the vice-president do but also melt away the assembly melts under such pressure into delinquium or as it is officially called adjourns maillard is dispatched to paris with the decree concerning grains in his pocket he and some women in carriages belonging to the king thitherward slim louison chabray has already set forth with that written answer which the twelve she-deputies returned in to seek slim sylph she has set forth through the black muddy country she has much to tell her poor nerves so flurried and travels as indeed to-day on this road all persons do with extreme slowness president moynier has not come nor the acceptance pure and simple though six hours with their events have come though courier on courier reports that lafayette is coming coming with war or with peace it is time that the chateau also should determine on one thing or another that the chateau also should show itself alive if it would continue living victorious joyful after such delay monnier does arrive at last and the hard-earned acceptance with him which now alas is of small value fancy monnier surprised to find his senate whom he hoped to charm by the acceptance pure and simple all gone and in its stead a senate of menads for as erasmus's ape mimicked say with wooden splint erasmus shaving so do these amazons hold in mock majesty some confused parody of national assembly they make motions deliver speeches pass enactments productive at least of loud laughter all galleries and benches are filled a strong dame of the market is in monnier's chair not without difficulty monnier by aid of macers and persuasive speaking makes his way to the female president the strong dame before abdicating signifies that for one thing she and indeed her whole senate male and female for what was one roasted war-horse among so many are suffering very considerably from hunger experienced monnier in these circumstances takes a twofold resolution to reconvoke his assembly members by sound of drum also to procure a supply of food swift messengers fly to all bakers cooks pastry cooks vintners restorers drums beat accompanied with shrill vocal proclamation through all streets they come the assembly members come what is still better the provisions come on tray and barrow come these latter loaves wine great store of sausages the nourishing baskets circulate harmoniously among the benches nor according to the father of epics did any soul lack a fair share of victual an equal diet highly desirable at the moment gradually some hundred or so of assembly members get edged in menadism making way a little round monnier's chair listen to the acceptance pure and simple and begin what is the order of the night discussion of the penal code all benches are crowded in the dusky galleries duskier with unwashed heads is a strange coruscation of impromptu bill-hooks it is exactly five months this day since these same galleries were filled with high-plumed jewelled beauty reigning bright influences and now to such length have we got in regenerating france methinks the travail throws are of the sharpest menadism 
will not be restrained from occasional remarks asks what is the use of the penal code the thing we want is bread mirabeau turns round with lion-voiced rebuke monadism applauds him but recommences thus they chewing tough sausages discussing the penal code make night hideous what the issue will be lafayette with his thirty thousand must arrive first him who cannot now be distant all men expect as the messenger of destiny end of section forty eight section forty nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or if you wish to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim mcdougall the french revolution by thomas carlyle volume one book seven chapter nine lafayette towards midnight lights flare on the hill lafayette's lights the roll of his drums comes up the avenue de versailles with peace or with war patience friends with neither lafayette has come but not yet the catastrophe he has halted and harangued so often on the march spent nine hours on four leagues of road at montreuil close on versailles the whole host had to pause and with uplifted right hand in the murk of night to these pouring skies swear solemnly to respect the king's dwelling to be faithful to king and national assembly rage is driven down out of sight by the laggard march the thirst of vengeance slaked in weariness and soaking clothes flandre is again drawn out under arms but flandre grown so patriotic now needs no exterminating the wayworn battalions halt in the avenue they have for the present no wish so pressing as that of shelter and rest anxious sits president mounier anxious the chateau there is a message coming from the chateau that monsieur mounier would please return thither with a fresh deputation swiftly and so at least unite our two anxieties anxious mounier does of himself send meanwhile to apprise the general that his majesty has been so gracious as to grant us the acceptance pure and simple the general with a small advance column makes answer in passing speaks vaguely some smooth words to the national president glances only with the eye at that so mixed to form national assembly then fares forward towards the chateau there are with him two paris municipals they were chosen from the three hundred for that errand he gets admittance through the locked and padlocked grates through sentries and ushers to the royal halls the court male and female crowds on his passage to read their doom on his face which exhibits say historians a mixture of sorrow of fervour and valour singular to behold the king with monsieur with ministers and marshals is waiting to receive him he has come in his high-flowing chivalrous way to offer his head for the safety of his majesties the two municipals state the wish of paris four things of quite pacific tenor first that the honour of guarding his sacred person be conferred on patriot national guards say the centre grenadiers who as guard francaise were wont to have that privilege second that provisions be got if possible third that the prisons all crowded with political delinquents may have judges sent them fourth that it would please his majesty to come and live in paris to all which four wishes except the fourth his majesty answers readily yes or indeed may almost say that he has already answered it to the fourth he can answer only yes or no would so gladly answer yes and no but in any case are not their dispositions thank heaven so entirely pacific there is time for deliberation the brunt of the danger seems past lafayette and d'estaing settle the watches Centre grenadiers are to take the guard room they of old occupied as guard francais for indeed the guard de corps its late ill-advised occupants are gone mostly to rambouillet that is the order of this night sufficient for the night is the evil thereof whereupon lafayette and the two municipals with high flow and chivalry take their leave so brief has the interview been mounier and his deputation were not yet got up 
so brief and satisfactory, a stone is rolled from every heart. The fair palace dames publicly declare that this Lafayette, detestable though he be, is their saviour for once. Even the ancient vinaigrous taunts admitted, the king's aunts, ancient grail and sisterhood known to us of old. Queen Marie Antoinette has been heard often say the like. She alone, among all women and all men, wore a face of courage, of lofty calmness and resolve this day. She alone saw clearly what she meant to do, and Theresa's daughter dares to do what she means, were all France threatening her, abide where her children are, where her husband is. Towards three in the morning, all things are settled. The watch is set, the centre grenadiers put into their old guard room and harangued, the Swiss and few remaining bodyguards harangued, the way-worn Paris battalions, consigned to the hospitality of Versailles, lie dormant in spare beds, spare barracks, coffee-houses, empty churches. A troop of them, on their way to the church of Saint-Louis, awoke poor Weber, dreaming troublous in the Rue Sartorie. Weber has had his waistcoat pocket full of balls all day, two hundred balls and two pairs of powder, for waistcoats were waistcoats then, and had flaps down to mid-thigh. So many balls he has had all day, but no opportunity of using them. He turns over now, execrating disloyal bandits, swears a prayer or two, and straight to sleep again. Finally, the National Assembly is harangued, which thereupon, on motion of Mirabeau, discontinues the penal code and dismisses for this night. Menadism, sans has cowered into guardhouses, barracks of Flandre, to the light of cheerful fire, failing that to churches, office houses, sentry boxes, wheresoever wretchedness can find a lair. The troublous day has brawled itself to rest. No lives yet lost, but that of one war horse. Insurrectionary chaos lies slumbering round the palace, like ocean round a diving bell. No crevice yet disclosing itself. Deep sleep has fallen promiscuously on the high and on the low, suspending most things, even wrath and famine. Darkness covers the earth. But far on the northeast, Paris flings up her great yellow gleam, far into the wet black night. For all is illuminated there, as in the old July nights, the streets deserted, for alarm of war, the municipals all wakeful, patrols hailing with their horse who goes. There, as we discover, our poor slim Louison Chabray, her poor nerves all fluttered, is arriving about this very hour. There Usher Maillard will arrive, about an hour hence, toward four in the morning. They report successively to a wakeful Hôtel de Ville what comfort they can report, which again, with early dawn, large comfortable placards shall impart to all men. Lafayette, in the Hôtel de Noailles, not far from the chateau, having now finished haranguing, sits with his officers consulting. At five o'clock, the unanimous best counsel is that a man so tossed and toiled for twenty-four hours and more fling himself on a bed and seek some rest. Thus, then, has ended the first act of the insurrection of women. How will it turn on the morrow? The morrow, as always, is with the fates. But his majesty, one may hope, will consent to come honorably to Paris. At all events, he can visit Paris. Anti-national bodyguards, here and elsewhere, must take the national oath, make reparation to the tricolor. Flandre will swear. There may be much swearing, much public speaking there will infallibly be, and so with harangues and vows may the matter in some handsome way wind itself up. Or, alas, may it not be all otherwise unhandsome, the consent not honorable, but extorted, ignominious. Boundless chaos of insurrection presses slumbering round the palace, like ocean round a diving bell, and may penetrate at any crevice. Let but that accumulated insurrectionary mass find entrance, like the infinite inburst of water, or, say rather, of inflammable, self-igniting fluid, for example, turpentine and phosphorus oil, fluid known to Spinola Santerre. End of section 49
Section 50 of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Allen. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 7, Chapter 10. The Grand Entreaties. The dull dawn of a new morning, drizzling and chill, but had broken off over Versailles, when it pleased destiny that a bodyguard should look out of window on the right wing of the chateau to see what prospect there was in heaven and in earth. Rascality, male and female, is prowling in view of him. His fasting stomach is, with good cause, sour. He perhaps cannot forbear a passing malice on them. Least of all can he forbear answering such. Ill words breed worse, till the worst word came, and then the ill deed. Did the maldicent bodyguard, getting, as was too inevitable, better maldiction than he gave, load his musketoon, and threaten to fire, and actually fire, were wise to whist. It stands asserted, to us not credibly. Be this as it may, menaced rascality and whinnying scorn, is shaking at all grates the fastenings of one some write it was a chain merely gives way rascality is in the grand court whinnying louder still the maledicent bodyguard more bodyguards than he do now give fire a man's arm is shattered the coin will depose that the sieur cardain a national guard without arms was stabbed but see sure enough Poor Jerome the Heretier, an unarmed National Guard he too, cabinet maker, a saddler's son, of Paris, with the down of youthhood still on his chin. He reels death-stricken, rushes to the pavement, scattering it with his blood and brains. Alleluia! Wilder than Irish wakes rises the howl, of pity, of intense revenge. In a few moments, the great of the inner and inmost court which they named the court of marble, this too is forced, or surprised, and burst open. The court of marble, too, is overflowed. Up the grand staircase, up all stairs and entrances, rushes the living deluge. The Schutz and Verigny, the two century bodyguards, are trodden down, are massacred with a hundred pikes. Women snatch their cutlasses or any weapon, and storm in monadic. Other women lift the corpse of the shot Jerome, lay it on the marble steps. There shall the livid face and smashed head, dumb forever, speak. Woe now to all bodyguards. Mercy is none for them. Mion Mandre de Saint-Marie pleads with soft words on the grand staircase, descending four steps to the roaring tornado. His comrades snatch him up by the skirts and belts, literally from the jaws of destruction and slam to their door. This also will stand few instants. The panels shivering in like potsherds. Barricade serves not. Fly fast, ye bodyguards. Rabid insurrection like the hellhound chase. Uproaring at your heels. The terror-struck bodyguards fly, bolting and barricading. It follows. Witherward! Through hall on hall. Woe now! Towards the queen's suite of rooms in the farthest room of which the queen is now asleep five sentinels rush through that long suite they are in the ant-room knocking loud save the queen trembling women fall at their feet with tears are answered yes we will die save ye the queen tremble not women but haste for lo another voice shouts far through the outermost door save the queen and the door shut it is brave Mjolmendre's voice that shouts the second warning. He has stormed across imminent death to do it, fronts imminent death, having done it. Brave Tardive du Repari, bent on the same desperate service, was borne down with pikes. His comrades hardly snatch him in again alive. Mio Mandre and Tarbade let the names of these two bodyguards, as the names of brave men should, live long. Trembling maids of honor, one whom, from afar, caught glimpse of Mion Mondre, as well as heard him, hastily wrapped the queen, not in robes of state. She flies for her life across the Oil de Bouffe, 
against the main door of which, too, insurrection batters. She is in the king's apartment, in the king's arms. She clasps her children amid a faithful few. The imperial hearted bursts into mother's tears. O oh, my friends, save me and my children. O oh, mia mis, suave moi mia fond. The battering of insurrectionary axes clangs audible across the oil de bouf. What an hour! Yes, friends, a hideous, fearful hour, shameful alike to governed and governor, wherein governed and governor ignominiously testify that their relation is at an end. Rage, which had brewed itself in twenty thousand hearts for the last four and twenty hours, has taken fire. Jerome's brained corpse lies there as live coal. It is, as we said, the infinite element bursting in, wild surging through all corridors and conduits. Meanwhile, the poor bodyguard have got hunted mostly into the Oeil de Bouffe. They may die there at the king's threshold. They can do little to defend it. They are heaping tabourets, stools of honor, benches and all movables against the door at which the axe of insurrection thunders. But did brave Mjolmin Dre perish, then, at the queen's door? No, he was fractured, slashed, lacerated, left for dead. He has nevertheless crawled hither, and shall live, honored of loyal France. Remark also, in flat contradiction to much which has been said and sung, that insurrection did not burst that door he had defended, but hurried elsewhither, seeking new bodyguards. Poor bodyguards with their thesis, opera repast. Well, for them, that insurrection has only pikes and axes, no right sieging tools. It shakes and thunders. Must they all perish miserably, and royalty with them? The Schutz and Varigny, massacred at the first inbreak, have been beheaded in the marble court, a sacrifice to Jerome's manes. Jordan, with a tiled beard, did that duty willingly, and asked if there were no more. Another captive they are leading round the corpse, with howling chauntings. May not Jordan again tuck up his sleeves? And louder and louder rages insurrection within, plundering if it cannot kill. Louder and louder it thunders at the Oeil de Bouf. What can now hinder its bursting in? On a sudden it ceases. The battering has ceased. Wild rushings. The cries grow fainter. There is silence, or the tramp of regular steps. Then a friendly knocking. We are the centre grenadiers, old guards francais. Open to us, messieurs of the garde de cour. We have not forgotten how you saved us at Fontenoy. The door is open. Enter Captain Gondrain and the centre grenadiers. There are military embracings. There is a sudden deliverance from death into life. Strange sons of Adam, it was to exterminate these guards de corps that the centre grenardier left home, and now they have rushed to save them from extermination. The memory of common peril, of old help, melts the rough heart. Bosom is clasped to bosom, not in war. The king shows himself one moment through the door of his apartment with, Do not hurt my guards! Soyons, Vare, let us be brothers, cries the captain Gondran, and again dashes off with leveled bayonets to sweep the palace clear. Now, too, Lafayette, suddenly roused, not from sleep, for his eyes had not yet closed, arrives with passionate popular eloquence, with prompt military word of command, National Guard suddenly roused by sound of trumpet and alarm drum, are all arriving. The death melee ceases. The first skyline bent blaze of insurrection is got damped down. It burns now, if unextinguished yet flameless, as charred coals do, and not inextinguishable. The king's apartments are safe. Ministers, officials, and even some loyal national deputies are assembling round their majesties. The consternation will, with sobs and confusion, settle down gradually into plan and counsel, better or worse. But glance now for a moment from the royal windows, a roaring sea of human heads, inundating both courts, billowing against all passages, menatic women, 
infuriated men, mad with revenge, with love of mischief, love of plunder. Rascality has slipped its muzzle, and now bays, three-throated, like the dog of Erebus. Fourteen bodyguards are wounded, two massacred, and as we saw, beheaded. Jourdain asking, Was it worthwhile to come so far for two? Hapless to shoots and Varigny, their fate surely was sad, whirled down so suddenly to the abyss as men are. Suddenly, by the wide thunder of the mountain avalanche, awakened not by them, awakened far off by others. When the chateau clock last struck, they too were pacing languid with poised musketoon, anxious mainly that the next hour would strike. It has struck, to them, an audible. Their trunks lie mangled, their heads parade on pikes twelve feet long through the streets of Versailles, and shall about noon reach the barriers of Paris, a too ghastly contradiction to the large comfortable placards that have been posted there. The other captive bodyguard is still circling the corpse of Jerome amid Indian war-whooping, bloody talbeard, with tucked sleeves, brandishing his bloody axe, when Gundran and the Grenadiers come in sight. Comrades, will you see a man massacred in cold blood? Off, butchers, answer they, and the poor bodyguard is free. Busy runs Gundran, busy runs guards and captains, scouring at all corridors, dispersing rascality and robbery, sweeping the palace clear. The mangled carnage is removed, Jerome's body to the town hall for inquest. The fire of insurrection gets damped more and more into measurable, manageable heat. Transcend things of all sorts, as in the general outburst of multitudinous passion, are huddled together, the ludicrous, nay, the ridiculous, with the horrible. Far over the billowy sea of heads may be seen rascality, caprioling on horses from the royal stud, the spoilers these, for patriotism is always infected so, with a proportion of mere thieves and scoundrels. Gondran snatched their prey from them in the chateau, whereupon they hurried to the stables and took horses there. But the generous Diomedes' steeds, according to Weber, disdained such scoundrel burden, and flinging up their royal heels, did soon project most of it in parabolic curves to a distance amid peals of laughter, and were caught. Mounted National Guards secured the rest. Now, too, is witnessed the touching last flicker of etiquette, which sinks not here, in the Chimerian world wreckage, without a sign, as the house cricket might still chirp in the pealing of a trump of doom. Monsieur, said some master of ceremonies, one hopes it might be debris as Lafayette in these fearful moments was rushing toward the inner royal apartment. Monsieur le Roy, vous accord le grand entry. Monsieur, the king grants you the grand entries, not finding it convenient to refuse them. End of section 50「ジェームズ・ウィリアムズ・ジョーナルズ・ドゥ・ブリュージェネラル・ジェネラル・ジェネラル・ジェネラル・ジェネラル・ジェネラル・ジェネラル・ジェネラル・ジェネラル・ジェネラル・ジェネラル・ジェネラル・ジェネラル・ジェネラル・ジェネラル・ジェネラル・ジェネラル・ジェ Extruding miscellaneous patriotism, for most part, into the grand court, or even into the forecourt. The bodyguards, you can observe, have now of a verity hoisted the national cockade, for they step forward to the windows or balconies, hats aloft in hand, on each hat a huge tricolor, and fling over their bandoliers in sign of surrender, and shout, Vive la nation! To which How can the generous heart respond but with Vive le roi! Vive le g a r d e du corps! His Majesty himself has appeared with Lafayette on the balcony and again appears. Vive le roi! greets him from all throats, but also from some one throat is heard 
Le roi à Paris, the king to Paris. Her majesty, too, on demand, shows herself, though there is peril in it. She steps out on the balcony with a little boy and girl. No children, point d'enfants, cried at voices. She gently pushes back her children and stands alone, her hands serenely crossed on her breast. Should I die, she had said, I will do it. Such serenity of heroism has its effect. Lafayette, with ready wit, in his high-flown, chivalrous way, takes that fair, queenly hand, and reverently kneeling, kisses it. Thereupon the people do shout, Vive la Reine! Nevertheless, poor Weber saw, or even thought he saw, for hardly the third part of poor Weber's experiences in such hysterical days will stand scrutiny. One of these brigands level his musket at Her Majesty, with or without intention to shoot, for another of the brigands angrily struck it down. So that all, and the Queen herself, nay, the very captain of the bodyguards, have grown national. The very captain of the bodyguards steps out now with Lafayette. On the head of the repentant man is an enormous tricolour, large as a soup platter or sunflower, visible to the utmost forecourt. He takes the national oath with a loud voice, elevating his hat, at which sight all the army raise their bonnets on their bayonets with shouts. Sweet is reconcilement to the heart of man. Lafayette has sworn Flandre. He swears the remaining bodyguards down in the marble court. The people clasp them in their arms. Oh, my brothers, why would you force us to slay you? Behold, there is joy over you as over returning prodigal sons. The poor bodyguards, now national and tricolour, exchange bonnets, exchange arms. There shall be peace and fraternity. And still, vive le roi, and also le roi à Paris, not now from one throat, but from all throats as one, for it's the heart's wish of all mortals. Yes, the king to Paris, what else? Ministers may consult, and national deputies wag their heads, but there is now no other possibility. You have forced him to go willingly. At one o'clock, Lafayette gives audible assurance to that purpose and universal insurrection with immeasurable shout, and a discharge of all the firearms, clear and rusty, great and small, that it has, returns him acceptance. What a sound, heard for leagues, a doom peal! That sound, too, rolls away into the silence of ages, and the Chateau of Versailles stands ever since vacant, hushed still. Its spacious courts grass-grown, responsive to the hoe of the weeder. Times and generations roll on in their confused gulf current, and buildings, like builders, have their destiny. Till one o'clock, then, there will be three parties, National Assembly, National Rascality, National Royalty, all busy enough. Rascality rejoices, women trim themselves with tricolour. Nay, motherly Paris has sent her avengers sufficient cartloads of loaves, which are shouted over, which are gratefully consumed. The avengers, in return, are searching for grain stores, loading them in fifty wagons, that so a national king, probable harbinger of all blessings, may be the evident bringer of plenty, for one. And thus has sansculottism made prisoner its king, revoking his parole. The monarchy has fallen, and not so much as honourably, no, ignominiously, with struggle indeed oft repeated, but then with unwise struggle, wasting its strength in fits and paroxysms, that every new paroxysm foiled more pitifully than before. Thus Broglie's whiff of grape-shot, which might have been something, has dwindled to the pot valour of an opera repast, and, O oh Richard, O oh mon roi, which again we shall see dwindle to a favra conspiracy, a thing to be settled by the hanging of one chevalier. Poor monarchy! But what save foulest defeat can await that man who wills and yet wills not? Apparently the king either has a right, assertable as such to the death, before God and man, or else he has no right. Apparently the one or the other. Could he but know which? 
may heaven pity him. Were Louis wise, he would this day abdicate. Is it not strange so few kings abdicate, and none yet heard of has been known to commit suicide? Fritz I of Prussia alone tried it, and they cut the rope. As for the National Assembly, which decrees this morning that it is inseparable from His Majesty and will follow him to Paris, there may one thing be noted, its extreme want of bodily health. After the 14th of July there was a certain sickliness observable among honourable members, so many demanding passports on account of infirm health. But now, for these following days, there is a perfect murian, President Mounier, Lally Tollendal, Clermont Tonnerre, and all constitutional two-chamber royalists needing change of air, as most no-chamber royalists had formerly done. For in truth it is the second emigration this that has now come, most extensive among commons deputies, noblesse, clergy, so that to Switzerland alone there go sixty thousand. They will return in the day of accounts, yes, and have hot welcome but emigration on emigration is the peculiarity of France. One emigration follows another, grounded on reasonable fear, unreasonable hope, largely also on childish pet. The high flyers have gone first, now the lower flyers, and ever the lower will go down to the crawlers, whereby, however, cannot our National Assembly so much the more commodiously make the Constitution your two-chamber anglomaniacs being all safe, distant on foreign shores. Abbe Maury is seized and sent back again, he, tough as ten leather, with eloquent Captain Cazal and some others, will stand it out for another year. But here, meanwhile, the question arises, was Philippe d'Orléans seen this day in the Bois de Boulogne, in grey surtout, waiting under the wet sere foliage, what the day might bring forth. Alas, yes, the aidolon of him was, in Weber's and other such brains. The Châtelet shall make large inquisition into the matter, examining a hundred and seventy witnesses, and Deputy Chabrou publish his report, but disclose nothing further. What then has caused these two unparalleled October days? For surely such dramatic exhibition never yet enacted itself without dramatist and machinist. Wooden punch emerges not, with its domestic sorrows, into the light of day, unless the wire be pulled. How can human mobs? Was it not D'Orléans, then, and Leclos, Marquis Sillery, Mirabeau, and the sons of confusion, hoping to drive the king to Metz, and gather the spoil? Nay, was it not, quite contrariwise, the Eur de Boeuf, bodyguard Colonel de Guiche, minister Saint Priest, and high-flying loyalists, hoping also to drive him to Metz, and try it by the sword of civil war. Good Marquis Toulonjon, the historian and deputy, feels constrained to admit that it was both. Alas, my friends, credulous incredulity is a strange matter. But when a whole nation is smitten with suspicion and sees a dramatic miracle in the very operation of the gastric juices, what help is there? Such nation is already a mere hypochondriac bundle of diseases, as good as changed into glass, atrabiliar, decadent, and will suffer crises. Is not suspicion itself the one thing to be suspected, as Montaigne feared only fear? Now, however, the short hour has struck. His Majesty is in his carriage, with his Queen, Sister Elizabeth, and two royal children. Not for another hour can the infinite procession get marshalled and under way. The weather is dim drizzling, the mind confused, and noise great. Processional marches not a few our world has seen, Roman triumphs and ovations, Kabyric symbol beatings royal progresses, Irish funerals, but this of the French monarchy marching to its bed remained to be seen. Miles long and of breath losing itself in vagueness, for all the neighbouring country crowds to see. Slow, stagnating along, like shoreless lake, yet with a noise like Niagara, like Babel and Bethlehem, 
a splashing and a tramping, a hurrahing, uproaring, musket volleying, the truest segment of chaos seen in these latter ages, till slowly it disembogue itself in the thickening dusk into expectant Paris through a double row of faces all the way from Passy to the Hôtel de Ville. Consider this, vanguard of national troops, with trains of artillery, of pikemen and pike women, mounted on cannons, on carts, hackney coaches, or on foot, tripudiating, in tricolour ribbons from head to heel, loaves stuck on the point of bayonets, green bows stuck in gun barrels. Next, as main march, fifty cartloads of corn which have been lent for peace from the stores of Versailles behind which follow stragglers of the Garde du Corps, all humiliated in grenadier bonnets. Close on these comes the royal carriage, come royal carriages, for there are a hundred national deputies too, among whom sits Mirabeau, his remarks not given. Then finally, pell-mell, as rear-guard, Flandre, Swiss, hundred Swiss, other bodyguards, brigands, whosoever cannot get before between and among all which masses flows without limit saint antoine and the menetic cohort menetic especially about the royal carriage tripudiating there covered with tricolour singing elusive songs pointing with one hand to the royal carriage which the illusions hit and pointing to the provision wagons with the other hand and these words courage friends we shall not want bread now we are bringing you the baker the bakeress and baker's boy le boulanger la boulangère et le petit mitron the wet day draggles the tricolour but the joy is unextinguishable is not all well now ah madame notre bonne reine said some of these strong women some days hence ah madame our good queen don't be a traitor any more ne soyez plus traître and we will all love you poor weber went splashing along close by the royal carriage with a tear in his eye their majesties did me the honour or i thought they did it to testify from time to time by shrugging of the shoulders by looks directed to heaven the emotions they felt thus like frail cockle floats the royal lifeboat helmless on black deluges of rascality mercier in his loose way estimates the procession and assistance at two hundred thousand. He says it was one boundless inarticulate ha-ha, transcendent world laughter, comparable to the Saturnalia of the ancients. Why not? Here, too, as we said, is human nature once more human. Shudder at it, whoso is of shuddering humour. Yet, behold, it is human. It has swallowed all formulas. It tripudiates even so for which reason they that collect vases and antiques with figures of dancing bacchants in wild and all but impossible positions may look with some interest on it thus however has the slow-moving chaos or modern saturnalia of the ancients reached the barrier and must hold to be harangued by mayor bailly thereafter it has to lumber along between the double row of faces in the transcendent heaven-lashing ha-ha two hours longer towards the Hôtel de Ville, then again to be harangued there by several persons, by Moreau de Saint-Marie, among others, Moreau of the Three Thousand Orders, now National Deputy for San Domingo, to all which poor Louis, who seemed to experience a slight emotion on entering this town hall, can answer only that he comes with pleasure, with confidence among his people. Mayor Bailly, in reporting it, forgets confidence, and the poor queen says eagerly, Add with confidence. Messieurs, rejoins Bailly, you are happier than if I had not forgot. Finally, the king is shown on an upper balcony by torchlight, with a huge tricolour in his head, and all the people, says Weber, grasped one another's hands, thinking now surely the new era was born. Hardly till eleven at night can royalty get to its vacant, long deserted palace of the Tuileries, to lodge there somewhat in strolling player fashion it is tuesday the sixth of october seventeen eighty nine 
poor Louis has two other Paris processions to make. One ludicrous, ignominious like this, the other not ludicrous nor ignominious, but serious, nay, sublime. End of the first volume. End of section 51. End of the French Revolution, volume 1 by Thomas Carlyle.